Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tim Team Cup May Edition. I, I'm East. I'm going to be casting Nekoblocky versus Sryzen today. Hope everyone's having a good night out there. Or good day, wherever your time zone may be. It's uh, 1 a.m. over here on the West Coast. Uh, and we're right into our openers. Looks like Nekoblocky had the Oshiara band out and has first picked Amphitir. Sryzen has Fire Koish band and has responded with Ragnit and Mashuk. It's a pretty strong anti Amphitir opener here. You can pull the electric attacks away with Electric Custodian if it is, in fact, Electric Custodian on the Ragnit. And Mushuk can't be dealt super effective damage and can deal 2x back with Wastewater. Uh, Nekoblocky has a few different answers to Mashuk, but being able to answer both Mashuk and Ragnit using this one pick could be a little bit difficult, and they decide to go with Valash here in order to do so, giving them a way to hit 2x into the Ragnit, maybe threaten it out. We'll see how it plays out. Second ban is up. Sorizen seems to be favoring a pretty aggressive team here. We see the Chromion, the Mimit, Hedgen forming that kind of triple digital microwaves core um, as an option, as well as Oshiara, Fire Koish, Mushuk, Valash, all very powerful, uh, aggressive Thames. And we see Tolkien banned out. That's a good anti-aggro ban. Tolkien can come in and use Heater to apply Burn to do 30% less damage to the opposing board. And Hedgen is banned in response. Bullrun picked up. Is he very strong against Mushuk and generally pretty good at bulking up in front of special attacks. The Chromion comes next, followed by Mimit. Mimit had a suiting toolbox aggro generally very well. Uh, it's a Tem that can reinforce the powerful aggro leads um, or just duplicate something of its opponents and do a lot of damage with Doppelganger Brooch. Interesting to see how the Mimit is um, built on this team. There are three physical attackers and four special attackers. Well, either three and four or four and three, depending on how the Valash is built. So interesting to see how uh, Sarazen's Mimit complements their team. Volfi picked out in response. Um, again, another Tim that can be built uh, pretty bulkily in response to an aggressive lineup. And the Mimit uh, coming from Nekoblocky as well. So we will see some Mimit on Mimit action in uh, this first of the best of two. And then Balash's pick, so we're into the into the match. Uh, it's going to be quite an interesting opener here as we've got these two electric Thames staring each other down. And um, Balash able to hit the Ragnit and Mushrik able to hit either slot for big damage, so... Tem's going to be pressured here. Interesting to see what the opener will be. Um, the tempo... Sryzen is definitely the player who... Um, they are are the, the player that kind of has to play a, a more aggressive uh, style and tempo based on how their team just matches up. So we'll see how um, Blocky kind of responds turn one here. Everyone stays in. Amphitir does go for the Plague, so it looks like this is a double lined up into Ragnit. Ragnit is locked in. Does it live the spikes? Let's see. No, it does not. All right, so... Blocky scoring the early kill here. The Lash will take some damage in return from Mashuk. And Mimit comes in in response. Now, this Mimit is going to turn into... Valash gets access to Scavenger and Crystal Damage, which is something that Sryzen's team didn't have. And it does have an answer, of course, in the back with the Volfi on Nekoblocky's side. Um, but it does immediately threaten out Amphitir. Uh, interesting to see if 
Nekoblaki will be able to swap out their Amphitir here, or if Stryzen will go for the Cage on Meshook to sort of guarantee themselves a double here. Because both of Nekoblaki's Thames look pretty vulnerable to Crystal Spikes as well as Meshook. This is where uh, how Sarizen's Mimit is constructed will mean a great deal. Whether or not they actually have special attack investment on the Crystal Spikes, or whether or not they're physically invested and therefore won't be able to punch quite as hard. Let's see. Looks like Neko Block is thinking this over. Uh, a swap is prudent for them, but they are in front of a cage. No swap and no cage from either side. The doppelganger brooch taking down the Valash. And the Thunder Strike will hit. Onto Mashuk, dealing just over 50%, so we know that a double will be very successful there. Uppercut hitting into Amphitir. Amphitir will likely have to overexert itself to use Thunder Strike, or close to overexert itself to use Thunder Strike to finish off Mashuk. But it can finish off Mashuk and is faster. But will it live Crystal Spikes if it chooses to do so? Meanwhile, in the back for Nekoblaki, we can see that Volarend, Volfi, Mimit, all legitimate swap ins here. Mimit's not particularly powerful, turning itself into. Amphitir, but it does come out, so looks like Nekoblaki very interested in continuing forth with an Amphitir into sort of the uh, end game state here. It's a it's a curious swap in given that there is crystal damage both on the board and in the back, and Chromion and Mashuk are not particularly uh, vulnerable, though a Thunder Strike. From the Amphitir will KO the Mashuk. So Mashuk comes out. The Lash is in, presumably to take a Thunder Strike. Let's see what happens here. Oh, big damage from the Crystal Spikes, but it just manages to survive. The Doppelganger Brooch, Crystal Spikes, not enough. The OX trapping in the over the Plague trapping in the overexerted Mashuk, OXing itself in the process. Mimic goes for the Thunder Strike, not very much damage at all. So we've got two overexerted Thames, one of which is locked in for at least two more turns. But with an OX Tem on their own board, it's going to be difficult for Nekoblaki to score a KO on the OX Mimit Village, given that Crystal Spikes can threaten the kill on the Mimit itself. However, if it is Doppelganger Brooch on the Mimit, the Plague will deal 50% more damage, and that might be enough to KO Razowski here, the Mimit Valash. There's so many Valashes and so many Amphitiers. We've got um, some synergy, uh, some symmetry coming out from both players here. The HP bar is generally favoring Sarizen slightly, but this is a very interesting turn. So out comes Amphitir, in comes Volfi, hoping to take a Crystal Spikes here. Mimit knocks itself out due to OX. This is going to actually trigger both Scavengers, and it is physical Velash. So that base jump actually doing great damage. With the resistance badge, that's a lot of damage. Sarizen managing to deal almost 60% to that Volfi on the swap-in. This is one of the great advantages of physical Velash, is that it allows it to threaten Volfis if it nails it on the swap-in. This Volfi is going to have a very difficult time getting off a Dust Vortex in front of two Crystal Temps, and that's exactly what Sarizen needs in order to be able to continue to press their advantage. Now up 4 tens to 3. Volarend on the board can present some immediate damage with Feather Gatling onto either either 
Palash and does decently well into the remaining Thames in Sryzen's backline, but with the special Badger and the physical Badger, this is like a, a nightmarish Valash tag team. A tag team of scavengering Badgers. And they're going to keep applying pressure here. No swaps from any, temp, any Tamers. The base jump striking onto Volarend instead. Volarend following up with a Feather Gatling. That's going to KO Valash. That triggers the Scavenger. And another rest on the Valash. So that turned very, very strong for Nekoblocky. In comes Chromion. Chromion um, takes neutral damage from uh, both of Volaren's typings. Does do a great job of resisting Volfi. But now that the physical Valash is, is in... has been knocked out. I was going to say in the graveyard, but that's a little extra yeast. Let's keep it PG here. Um, it The Volfi all of a sudden becomes somewhat threatening. It does take decent damage from um, harmful microwaves, but no way for the Chromion to really get that damage off um, quickly with no synergy to speed up harmful microwaves. Interesting turn here. The uh, crystal damage is always going to be valuable into the Volaren slot, so that's probably where crystal spikes will lead here. And then it's just a matter of whether or not that 41% is enough for Volfi to stay alive long enough to have an impact on the Thames remaining. And we do know that if the end game plays up, oh, Ninja Jutsu coming through, and it does deal enough damage. Wow, that is very, very close. Major Torrent not dealing very much damage there. And Feather Gatling, more or less erasing the Scavenger proc and doing a little bit extra. But this is looking like a pretty favorable situation for Sryzen. Amphitur has a lot of work to do here. Uh, Resin Trap is online. Um, Vala the Mimit Valash is not overexerted, I believe, so it is going to be able to smash a Crystal Spikes into Volarend or Amphitur and deal big damage. We do know that Amphitur's Thunderstrike will KO Mashuk before it can move, if it's allowed to do so. Either way, uh, a lot of work for Amphitur and Volarent to do here, and not too much in the way of HP for them to do so. Sryzen does have a bit of work cut out for them dealing with Volarent, but we'll see what they decide to do here. It is Crystal Spikes right into the Amphitur, and that's just not quite enough. Rosowski damaged itself to overexertion. Plague will take it out. And now a very tough situation. Does Chromion manage to secure the KO? It goes for harmful microwaves, and it does. And now we are into a close endgame situation here. So we've got Meshook on Sryzen's side. Uh, uppercut will deal pretty decent damage into Volaren, but will it manage to survive the wind attack that Volaren has prepared for it? Feather Gatling, Hyperkinetic Strike, both a possibility. With Parrier uh, on Mashuk, it's difficult to say which one will deal more damage. Given the investment, it's likely Feather Gatling. Will Volaren be able to survive a double up from these Thames? It is Hyperkinetic Strike coming through onto Mashuk. And that's enough to KO. Volaren does slightly OX itself to do so. Harmful Microwaves. Huge OX from the Chromion. So close. This is going to come down to a photo finish here. Both Thames have to rest due to overexerting themselves. Can Volaren get ahead of Chromion with Feather Gatling? Or will HKS be enough damage to take out the Chromion? Likely it will. 
and there are no prio moves on the side of Strizen, but they do have access to hologram. Will they use hologram to try and read the attack here? There's the hologram. Does Blocky go for it? They do! Hyperkinetic Strike OX is the Vola. Big read there by Strizen, and that is going to take game number one. Harmful Microwaves KOing the Vola end. Right down to the very last, Strizen takes game one on 8% HP with a Nature Chromion. Strong read from them using Hologram. And that's going to take game number one. Wow. Um, super close match. Uh, really gets you out of your seat. Out of your seat entertainment. I am standing right now uh, behind the caster's mic. Let's uh, get right into game number two here. See as they uh, get going. Looks like Strizen is going to invite game number two. All right, and the big change here in the draft is that Strizen will have first ban and first pick. So let's see if having the last pick dynamic changes anything for Nekoblocky in game two. Um, very, very close showing. It literally came down to one read to decide game number one. Very evenly matched. Both tamers going for the same bands as game one. Oceara and Fire Koish hitting the deck. Uh, obviously, Fire Koish enables a ton of very powerful aggressive openers from Strizen. And on Nekoblaki's side, Osiara dealing with a lot of the fires and digitals. Um, Nekoblaki opens this time with uh, Amphitir and Balash. Looks like this is um, the opener that they chose in response to Ragnit Mashuk was the orange side opener from Strizen in game one. And we know that this is a special attacking Valash with Crystal Spikes and Mushuk comes out. So we will see a uh, flip opener from game one, both players going for the same strategy. Mimit this time banned out by Nekoblocky, so there will not be any um, imposter Valash running around. And we'll see what Strizen... Strizen chose to ban out Tolkien last game. Looks like they're hovering Volarend, considering it. And it's going to be the Tolkien banned out. So Sryzen has, I believe, Oshi or no, Hedgen this game to work with. As opposed to last Hedgen, obviously very strong against the first two picks that Nekoblocky has made. Does not have a synergy partner for Hellfire, as Fire Koish and Mimit are banned out. Nature Chromion comes in. This is a Sinner type or Nature Chromion. And it does have microwave synergy now with Hedgen available. Now, last game, Nekoblocky um, supported their backline with, I believe, Mimit and Fulleran and Bolfi. See if they think that was correct. Mimit and Vola. It's tough to say if any tamer, either tamer came away from game one really wanting to change their game plan. I mean, the only adjustments we've seen so far is Mimit being second phase banned by Nekoblocky, because that game again was so close. Uh, really just coming down to a couple of reads here and there. So now Strizen is considering Oshiara or... 
Velash for their last pick. We will see the Hedgen in this game. Uh, so Microwave Synergy is online. I'm going to put them in the Microwave. And then maybe even the Hellfire Easy Bake Oven if they can't quite get it going. Volfi, last picked. So I believe the same draft from Nekoblocky. And then just Hedgen subbed in for uh, Mimit. Yes, Hedgen subbed in for Mimit on the side of Stryzen. All right, this is game number two. These are a best of two. So Nekoblacky is playing for a point, and Stryzen is playing for three points in this match. They will get one if they lose, and three if they win. So uh, this opener last time saw Stryzen's Ragnit hit the floor uh, as it was unable to take Plague plus Crystal Spikes. See if Sarizen is fine with that sacrifice again. No, they are not. So out comes Ragnit, and it will be Hedgen. The big difference from game number one coming in here. A Tem that is able to take Crystal Spikes, but as we can see here, Plague did not come out, which means that Amphitir reading the swap. Huge read there from Nekoblocky. Thunderstrike will KO Hedgen. Um, great adjustment. Great read from Nekoblocky. Taking out the Hedgen swap with the Ragnit read and now Valash coming in on the side of Sarizen but without Mimit to get access to turn one crystal damage this Amphitir is actually less threatened by this board state if you recall last game a similar board state where the Mimit had copied Nekoblocky's Valash but this one does not have access to crystal spikes because it's physical so this Amphitir can only get base jumped and with Hedgen gone, that's one thing that does threaten uh, Amphitir, as well as Valash, uh, off the board. But Sarizen lost a Tem on turn one and was able to come up with the victory all the same. So let's see how they respond here. All right, it will be Cage this time from the Mashuk, not wanting either of these attempts to get away. Uh, once again, Blocky does not, Neko Blocky does not switch in front of the Cage. Uh, coming up big, there's the Crystal Spikes, base jump, and is going to finish off Valash. I see someone in chat is asking what the score is. The score is currently 1-0 for Stryzen, and we are in game number two. All right, so the base jump picks up the KO Scavenger, saving a little bit of HP. Not sure if that Valash can take another Plague and survive, but it is locked in. It does have access to Sharp Stabs now, which can pretty reasonably threaten Amphitir. But Mashuk is just going to be a little bit too slow to get ahead of Plague or Thunderstrike to pick up the KO before Valash goes down. So the line of play for Amphitir is pretty clear here question is what comes in next to it we saw mimic come in next to amphitir last game uh, against a similar board state as well it was a very similar board state it was the mimic valash that uh so we saw double uh, Amphitir versus double Valash, and we will see double Amphitir again. So landing transmog, gonna get us um, more deer than we can handle. The double deer, if you will. Um, big uh, Fire Emblem Claude fans probably loving uh, what's going on right now as um, the double deer faces down Stars and Sport once again. So this, uh, this Valash is very likely um, finished this turn. Um, without Ninja Jutsu active, it's not going to get ahead of the Plague from the Mimit Amphitir. That's going to take it down. Not being able to get off Sharp Stabs there, um, kind of rough. Although the Mashuk will be able to counteract um, something here. 
The T-Strike actually... Oh, tireless proccing. Wastewater coming up from Mashook. That's going to be big damage. Wow, a one-shot. So Mashook activating tireless. We, we did, weren't actually able to see that in the last match. Um, tireless um, with the attack proccing before the attack lands, doing huge damage with wastewater. And Strizen with a smart read that most Mimit players are not running a lot of bulk investment. That Amphitheater gets deleted. And now, with an overexertion on the Amphitheater, uh, Stryzen's Mashook can deal some damage. However, there is that Volaren sitting in the back, and we know that now that it's tireless, it won't have the 30% parrier to live big damage from Volaren. Meanwhile, uh, Chromion and Ragnet also in the back line. Ragnet not really able to do too much about Volfi or Amphitheer, but is fairly threatening against Volarend. We'll see. Ragnet does come out here. Volarend comes in as well. Um, this is going to be pretty interesting board state here, as there is the option for Ragnet to get access to priority on Electro Punch with the digital Chromion sitting in the back. So, sort of a... Crouching Ragnet, uh, hidden, uh, incredibly aggressive bullet punch. I don't, I don't know if anyone would want to see that movie, but um, you know, it could be some laser fast kung fu coming Volaren's way. We could also see some, you know, mushroom fu here as activating tireless to secure a kill on Amphitheer. Probably something that Stryzen is considering as well. Let's see what the Tamers decide to do. Looks like Neko Blacky is thinking this one over. Will Amphitheer be needed later? They decide that it will. So out it comes. And it looks like Volfi onto the board. Mashuk swapped that as well. Chromion is here, so this will be a giga fast E punch if Ragnit so chooses. It does, and it goes for the Sparking Bullet. Interesting choice there. Uh, War Drum from the Ragnet. Um, with no neutral synergy, that Sparking Bullet hitting for 60 base power. Hyperkinetic Strike is active now for Volarend. But can it go faster than Ragnet's Electro Punch? I think we're about to find out. Interesting situation here as well as Volfi's mission for Neko Blacky is probably going to be to lay pressure into this Ragnet because with Ragnet on the board next to either Chromion or Mashuk, they're safe from being hit by Amphitheer's electric moves because Ragnet will just pull them right into it. Amphitheer swapping in. Probably aiming to take an Electro Punch. Hologram active on Chromion. Ragnet does go for the Electro Punch. That's not going to hurt very much. And the Dust Vortex. This read belongs to Neko Blocky. Wow, but the Dust Vortex dealing just not enough damage. Ragnet does live. Unfortunately, staring down an Amphitheer... Uh, and a plague from Volfi. It's pretty unlikely that Ragnet's going to be able to use a move before it goes down. Let's see what happens here. Ragnet opts for the cage. Trying to stop an Amphitheer swap. There is no swap. Down goes Ragnet. Amphitheer coming in with the Thunder Strike in response. And that will be enough to KO Chromion. And Amphitheer managed to stop itself from overexerting in the process, which means that this Mashuk 
is going to be a delicious Portobello burger, courtesy of the Thunderstrike and Nekoblocky with a clean response in game number two. And that's going to do it. Uh, for some reason, uh, my game is bugged and uh, won't show the victor, but the victor in this one is Nekoblocky, which means that we've got a tie. 1-1. Uh, one, one. Um, so Nekoblocky picking up one point and Sryzen picking up one point as well. Um, going to be... Uh, really interesting to see how Group B shakes out from here, because I believe that puts Ryzen in second place with four points, and Neka Blacky uh, picking up their first point of the tournament. But yeah, that was uh, Group D. Um, I believe we've got uh, more action coming up later on. Um, but that is all for myself tonight in uh, those two games, so... Hope everyone enjoyed, and uh, hope you enjoy the games uh, later on.
hello and welcome to this, uh, the Tem Team Cup May edition. I'm Quarter, and I'm really excited to show you this match between Shiznix and Trotter. This is, once again, our uh, best of twos right now as we go into our first game between them. Shiznix, of course, is known for some pretty intimidating plays, having some absolutely horrifying things on the team there. You'll see it's pretty much all aggression. We've got a Nesla, which they've shown to really good effect in some other tournaments so far. We've got the rare and zesty Valoran, which may not be so rare as we had initially expected, and the Nature Kush, which we've seen people tear things to pieces with. In the meantime, Trot's bringing their very unique team. Uh, they've got, of course, a number of Crystal Daily synergies there, the the almost eponymous Tordenite, and a uh, number of other pretty frightening threats. One fun thing that we get to see here, though, is the Nestle Mirror. We almost never get to see those. So just looking at the first bits here, we do see the Volfi ban out of Shizunix, and then the Vola ban out of uh, Trot. Both of these make perfect sense this far. Um, Valorant is just kind of monstrous into Trot's team, and at the same time, uh, we also have to bear in mind that Volfi does a lot into a nature, um, crystal core here. Like, even the Nest, like, so between the Nestla, like, about the, the Kinu is about the only thing there that really walls it. Uh, even Tolkien doesn't like taking care of it. Um, OCR doesn't necessarily get the KO. It's a very good first ban. In the meantime, we see a very bulky uh, Calibus tr uh, Tortonite lead out of Trot. Definitely something that he's been comfortable leading into aggression beforehand. It's something that he's been refining into this. And in the meantime, I'm kind of curious, do we see the Tolkien pick up? This is something people like Setska have used against Trotter in the past. But uh, Kinu Valis should actually be very strong into this as well. I think getting your madness buffs up early, uh, trying to divert the aggression by going like, hey, yo, you're going to hit the Kinu slot or whatever's going to come into that. And then trying to get a cheeky couple buffs up on Valish could be just what Shizunix needs here. We do see the Tolkien, though, which honestly is very strong into Trot's team. It's the sort of thing where, like, the, the 79 base special attack of Tolkien is just really powerful into what uh, Trot brings into this. Uh, obviously, it does have to be wary of things like that Yukama and the Nesla, and to certain degrees the uh, Mudrid as well, but um, definitely a powerful thing to be bringing onto this field. In the meantime, uh, we see the Kinu ban, we see the Madrid ban. Both of these make sense so far. The Crystal Deluge threat is something you always want to eliminate, and that Earth is kind of frightening into a lot of Shizunix's team. Same with the Crystal. So uh, after that, we see very quickly a Tort Nesla pickup, followed by a Yukama Barnshi pickup, with uh, a couple other flex slots still available on both sides. I kind of like the Nature Koish here out of um, Shizunix a bit more than I do the horse, but it looks like Shizunix is eyeing the horse up. I mean. It, there's no denying that Blizzard is still very effective against the two Toxics that Trot has brought, and in the meantime, you've got a lot of other frightening things as well, but they do go for the Nature Koish. Ultimately, I do think the Nature Koish will be more consistent into this, having Hypno for the slow things, Water Cutting Lily for the frail things, and generally being a massive problem. In the meantime, Trot has gone for the Adoros. With that, we go into our first game. Right, so getting into this, uh, this turn one is something we've seen before. Uh, Mucus Calibus, of course, is relatively unafraid of Tolkien, but it doesn't have a lot to respond with. What we could see here is perhaps a Strangle on the Valish. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how strong that actually is in hindsight, but it's something. We actually don't see any swaps out of Trot, perfectly willing to leave everything in there because he has to check this Madness buff, which does come down from Shizunix. We see the Crystal Spikes drop on it, and unfortunately, thanks to the burn alongside everything else, it does very little into Valish, but the Toxic Ink does a bit more. Um, it's likely that uh, the real reason why Trot kept his Tortonite in here is not just for the Crystal Spikes on the previous turn, which admittedly was still a bit of chip onto something that you want to get chip on, but it was also to get the Cage onto Valish to stop it from bouncing. My concern here is Tortonite just goes down this turn, right? Like, 
Nothing swaps in on that comfortably either. I think Yukama is the only thing that has a chance of surviving the tornado crystal spikes double in from a madness buff Valish. But you got to keep it in if you go for the cage, and that's precisely what Trot does. For him, cage is always the winning play. Getting that confined bonus onto Tort Knight and ensuring that the Valish is not able to bounce from his revenge kill, if that is indeed what he goes for. The problem is the scavenger buff is going to get that Valish a bit more comfortable. The Wind Burst is going to be coming down as well. The Reactive Vial does proc on his Calibus, getting it back into a more comfortable range, but the Strangle comes in, stopping an execution on the next thing that comes in, which is most likely going to be that Yukama, which we do see come out there. The Synergy Water Cannon is going to do a great job taking out the Valish and soaking whatever's going to be coming in from this Tolkien. We could see, however, a Fire Tornado land on the Calibus. That's still like reasonable damage and it conserves the Pryo on Tolkien. I kind of like that play out of Shizunix. But we'll have to see what goes down there. Um, I mean, it's not like the Tolkien's going anywhere, so we don't exactly have that as a problem. And in the meantime, I, I don't think you divert your aggression here. You got you got to take this madness about Valish out. If you leave this thing with the ability to scavenger its way back into the game, then it's just going to be such a hurdle for Trot to pass here, especially with those two mentals in the back that really don't want this madness buffed Valish anywhere near them. I mean, the Nestle is already going to be something of a problem with that now that the Tortonite's out. So, looking at this, it's pretty clear that we see the water cannon in on there, and thanks to the strangle, there's no real recourse that the Valish can do. The Valish just goes down, the strangle locking down the revenge kill. The token does go for a wind burst onto the Yukama, regardless, just trying to get a bit of burst, like sort of chip damage on there making it potentially easier for the Nature Koish to do its job. What we could very well see right now is sort of a Nature Koish swap in, followed by like a uh, uh, Nestle swap in on the other side. And then from that, we should be able to get everything going. And so we do see the Nature Koi swap in. So yeah, I'm expecting the Nestle to swap in on the other side to get the Synergy Master Bonus for the Water Cutting Lily, which only the Adora Boros will effectively be able to cover. Now, this is kind of a mind game because if we don't see the Water Cutting Lily on there as well, we could just see like a Wind Burst and a Water Cutting Lily hit the same spot, which I don't think anything takes comfortably in terms of the double in. Um, I, I don't see any fire damage coming out from Tolkien this turn, though. But I, I could be surprised by that. I just don't think that we, like, spend our fire tornado on a potential, like, of uh, Yukama staying in just an aquatic whirlwind, the Tolkien. Like, I think you got to get that bad boy out of there because it's still valuable against this Calibus. Um, the Nestla is a comfortable swap in. It can eat a single toxic ink because it is chamomile unless i'm horribly mistaken a lot of people are running chamomile nessa it's a very strong build because it means that you can get the thunder strike off without getting exhaust we do see the ukama swap for the adoro to eat the potential of a water cutting lily so we'll have to see whether this is another debate we do see a tortonite come in instead the mind games from shizenix starting to reveal themselves as the water cutting lily does come down the toxic ink will not do very much to to this Tortonite, if that is what is expected, it's a water jet instead, still walled by the Tortonite. And if this is a cage coming up from Shizenix, this is a really awkward spot for Trot. Now, right, if this is a cage, which you have to respect, then I don't think there's any recourse outside of strangling the Tortonite. Strangling the Tortonite feels good here. Like if you strangle the Tortonite in Virulent Gust, that could be one way that Trot tries to get out of this. I know that he likes his Virulent Gust. He's been very much a proponent of using that move. So if he uses that, that's probably gonna be a 
KO'd Koish for pretty sure. But uh, we could easily see the Tolkien swap back into there. I don't think I don't think you just leave Nature Koish on this field. But if you're doing that, then you're probably not caging. So we do see the Water Cutting Lily come out again onto the Calibus this time, getting some pretty ruinous damage onto it. The Crystal Spikes hits the Adoro, and the Adoro takes it thanks to the double screen and its high base special defense. Even with the Aloe Vera shown on the Tortonite, the Virulent Gust does go down, taking out the Nature Koish in one fell swoop. And the Strangle does go down on the Tortonite as he anticipated the cage play. This is a good mind game to go into Trot with, in my opinion. Trot is a player who will always value the cage on a Tortonite and will respect an opponent trying to use that against him, so he does cover that inside this scenario. While that was great damage into Trot, my concern here is, is that enough? Right, the Tolkien is going to despoil this field, though. Uh, one Windburst takes out Adora Boros, one Windburst probably takes out the Calibus as well. So it's a question of which slot goes down this turn. Um, I think you target the Adora Boros because we know that the Calibus has just strangled the Tort, so it can't move this turn. The challenge is, Trot's probably going to anticipate this, and getting a free swap in on Barnshee into a Windburst sounds like a pretty good play. We don't have the risk of a cage this turn, thanks to the Strangle, so unless this is just a double swap from Shizanix, where he like brings in the Nestle to cover the Barnshee coming in, I'm not entirely sure what the game plan is. Additionally, we still have the risk of the Calibus swapping out and getting that Yukama in on a safe slot. So I, I think that Shizunix is still in a very good position here. They just have to press their advantage effectively and not like not put their not put their aggression into an unwarranted position, right? Like you gotta hit the right targets each time. And that can be a taller order than one might expect, given the fact that there's a lot of separate things that you have to kind of take down in order here. And if you if you don't read them correctly, then Trot is going to just try to put walls up against you and use the fact that he still has more Thames as a way to get back into this game. Looking at this, though, one other concern I've got... Okay, so we don't have any energy manipulation synergies. We don't get anything too exciting from that, but we do see the Barnshee come in on the Calibus bodies, reading the Windburst potentially coming down there as the Windburst does come down into the Adora Boros instead, just kind of taking it out. No concerns there. This does mean, however, that the Yukama is able to come in. Yukama already has hold. The Barnshee has just gotten hold from the hard swap, meaning the Tornado is threatening the Tortonite. The Aquatic Whirlwind is threatening the Tolkien. And while Nesla eats both of these things, it can only come in on one slot. So I'm looking at this. And I'm wondering, like... I think you just attack here as Shizunix, honestly. Um, I think you just anticipate that per Okay, this is looking like an efficient Tortonite. I haven't seen, I haven't been looking for the procs for it, but it hasn't clicked Cage. And I know a lot of people don't actually run Confined right now because Stamina makes it really hard to run Confined. And an Aloe Vera Tortonite suggests that it's efficient due to the fact that you don't tend to run Not Sweat Band on Confined. And that would have been a lot more Stamina that we've seen. So, uh, on the assumption that this is an efficient Tortonite, we're not going to be seeing any cages come out, meaning that it is likely spe uh, speed teched and is probably just going to be throwing crystal spikes at this board, attempting to survive it. It also means, however, that it's probably not going to be as sturdy, meaning that this tornado might actually take it out. Um, this means that I kind of expect the Tolkien to be the swap point here, because you kind of still want the Tolkien into a lot of the back line. Um... It can kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Barnshee. It's not the best matchup, but you can do it. And it guarantees you against the Calibus, which is a significant answer to your Nestla. Even at 36%, you don't want to be taking those Toxic Inks. And you don't... I don't believe you take it down with a single Thunder Strike. Although I'm not sure about those Calics. Maybe at 36% you do. Still, though, I think that's the line of play from Shizunix. So Tolkien does swap as we do see the Nestle come in on that spot. There we go. And we do see that the Barnshee does outspeed. Does it take down the Tortonite? It does. The Tortonite is just down to the Tornado. Uh, no real issues there. The Aquatic Whirlwind will go into the Nestle. The Nestle eats that relatively comfortably. I do say relatively. 72% is still a lot from a resisted hit. That does give us some idea as to how squishy Nestle really can be. 
Um, like it's good, but you have to be aware of its weaknesses and hindrances as a Tem, uh, weak to a number of very powerful types and kind of a uh, niche pick in a lot of circumstances. But there are board states in which it thrives and this is most assuredly one of them. I feel like Trot kind of just has to go all in on this Tolkien right now and kind of just uh, survive. This, I think, is possible. We do see the tornado go in on the Yukama. Looks like it's just sort of all the aggression into this uh, fish, trying to make sure that it goes down. The bamboozle comes in onto the Barnshee, meaning that it is able to survive a turn potentially against this Nestla. Uh, if we see an electric storm that does come out, this does mean that there are now two targets for this Nestla to take down, but it's a drill Nestla! The drill tech taking Trot by surprise since we did notice that was not a chamomile that was on it that's an interesting thing to see okay right so from this point does calibus survive if it survives a single t-strike then we're in business because that toxic ink is most likely going to eliminate this tim it all comes down to a da to a damage calculation here and if trot can live a single thunder strike from neutral if not rough times we do see the test the thunderstrike come down is this it and it does not survive shizanix takes the first game with a drill nestla tearing apart the back line of trot getting rid of the boozles and just annihilating that meaning that there was no need to split the aggression at the final turn well played to shizanix wow okay so my first question there is, uh, I don't know if Trot actually changes his matchup into that. Honestly, I think he just has to be more careful with his Calibus going into that, because I think if he kept some more of his toxic tools into that, like there were just a couple turns where the token was allowed some undue aggression that kind of meant that his backline was a bit shattered when he wanted to throw that into the Nestla. And respecting that is definitely something that I think is a valuable concern. With that, we're just going to double check and see if both of our contestants are ready immediately to hop into their next match. And it looks like they are. Yeah, that Drill Nestle was magnificent. Drill with Electric Storm. Once again, I do love Drill on Thames that have access to spread moves. I think it's just much more valuable on them. And I don't think a lot of people are going to be expecting it on Nestle right now. I was certainly taken by surprise there. So uh, let's see whether, now that that cat's out of the bag, Trot adapts to it. And with that, we are in our second game as yeah once again so we're familiar with both of these teams by now obviously right so trot's team we we've established this before it's definitely a unique one to him he's got the confined tortonite he's still got the uh, first band there that's happened from shiznix onto his volfi not allowed to bring a volfi into this field uh volarend is not allowed anywhere near this team because it still dies a ton to that feathergat does a ton into half of it and honestly nox bomb does a ton into the other half we see the tortonite first pick so the next question here is uh what's next huh this is kind of uh, another like we could see yet another valish tolkien board there wasn't really as much to punish that but on counter pick you don't really want a mudrid just kind of hopping into that board so like we might see something a bit more conservative out of shizanix or something just to dissuade the mudrid first pick we actually see a much more conservative Kinu Valish board getting those buffs immediately onto the Badger to ensure that it's a bit more capable of dealing with some of this aggression, but that does mean that the Mudred isn't actually contested in terms of that opener, and it also means that Trot can first Trot can second ban the Tolkien. I actually think that this draft is much weaker for Shizanix. Like... It's it's kind of a rough spot. Like you don't really want to go counter. You don't really want to go as orange into like uh, nature coish because that does mean that like Trot can just pick a Doro into you and that feels terrible, or Calibus, which also feels terrible. But like it just feels like 
Shizunix let a lot more through this time and didn't really have a way to avoid that. Still though, as we go through, it's it's important to rem remind ourselves that plus one plus one on Valish and then a Madness buff is a nightmare. I don't think Valish has the position to Madness buff on this board, but uh, I do think getting your plus one plus one early on it is pretty rad. So in the meantime, we do see, of course, the Caliban and the Tolkien ban. All these things make perfect sense. Calibus is pretty nightmarish into the backline of Shizunix. Those three waters do not like that squid staring them in the face. And in the meantime, uh, we see the uh, Tolkien ban because, yeah, no, wind bad and wind hitting, wind hitting trot very bad. Uh, Tortonite even as well. Uh, the Adora Boros getting picked up alongside the Ukama does mean that there's still tools that he has for the backline of Shizunix, which is very weak to Toxic. And yeah, we're looking at the Nature Koish again. I think that is still pretty strong into this. I almost... Yeah, no, I still like that better because that gives you an answer to the Ukama alongside the Barnshee and the Mudrid. Uh, all of those together is pretty good. You still have to be aware of the Virulent Gust. I think you just never let it stay on a field with a Doro because that's just going to nuke it. And I don't think you have much recourse for that. E Doro is slower. It's a mental, meaning you cannot hypno-control it. If, maybe if you're running Rainbow Guard, that's the way out here. Uh, he's eyeballing the horse, though, and he picks that up instead, going for the burst damage and the priority that that gives you instead, giving him a bit more of a solid answer to the Mudrid while also having Blizzard tech for some of the toxics that we're seeing there. If that winds up coming to fruition and actually working out for him, fantastic. So into our game two, and I have to admit, I kind of prefer the board state that Trot has at the start of the game here. Even though it's a plus one, plus one Valish, it's staring some pretty frightening things down. And uh, unless it's physical, which we already saw that as a madness buffed Valish, that's not physical. It's gonna have a problem dealing with a Mudrid turn one. So we do see immediately the Tortonite swap in on Shizunix's Kinu slot. And the Valish also just immediately gets out of dodge, does not want to deal with that, swaps into the OCR to try to make sure that the Mud Shower that we are expecting to fall into that hits resisted into OCR instead. It does go down, and still, even though it's resisted, winds up getting it down to almost under 20, do, doing almost 20% to it, which alongside the Crystal Spikes puts this OCR at a pretty rough range. Obviously, Trot kind of has to reposition here a bit. I don't think you want to just willy-nilly sack your Mudrid when you're kind of saving that for Valish. And this does mean he's not allowed the cage play, but I do not think he's going to respect the cage play here. So, looking at that, my curiosity is, right, so if, if you're swapping Mudrid, what are you swapping that to? I think the only thing you can swap it to is Yukama here. Uh, Adoro and Barnshi are both covered by the Tortonite. That was a very good defensive swap by Shizunix as well, making sure that a lot of those things are going to go down. And the cage actually does go down on the efficient set, meaning that the Mudrid is not allowed to get out here. Trot does look like he respected the cage, though. As I've said time and time and again, he just kind of accepts that these things happen as he does keep the Mudrid in, trying to get an attack off, but he gets Aquatic Whirlwinded down by the OCR instead. And the Stonewall comes down, taking an advantage of this opportunity and accepting the fact that the other Tortonite is faster, meaning that this Tortonite is just going to be that much harder for Shizunix to take down. So, right. I guess this does mean Yukama can still come down into this lineup, but instead we see the incredibly ballsy Adoro swap in here. I'm kind of astonished by that one. Um, I guess this is for the virulent gust comeback into Osiara, but I'm pretty sure you could have just done that with Tortonite there. And in the meantime, that's that's kind of a big invi open invitation to get a crystal spikes in the face. Unless, of course, this is bait. The problem that I have with this being bait is, what is this bait for? It's not like he's got a defensive swap in for crystal spikes anymore. We do see the Serpentio's Wrath come in, and admittedly, Adoro eats that like a champ. The plus special, the high base special defense alongside the uh, resistance means that it takes functionally nothing from this. But the Crystal Spikes is going to be coming down like a mighty force, taking it down to 16.6%. And that is one of the best answers to the talk to the water back line that Shizunix has in the back there as the Crystal Spikes actually goes into Tortonite rather than the OCR as the virulent gust does hit the OCR to take it out. A bit of efficiency there trying to make sure that uh, the stamina expended by the Tortonite is not just thrown into a target that you know you can take out with something else, but now your boy Valish comes out to a much more comfortable field. This is probably one it can madness buff in, because, uh, yeah, that's kind of a nightmare. So looking at this, 
My next concern is this Adora is basically just dead, right? We see another cage here potentially, and this Adora just goes down. Uh, we see an energy manipulation onto the Tortonite, trying to make it over exert instead, which makes a certain degree of sense, but that also does mean that uh, Valish just kind of gets to madness buff uncontested here. The crystal spikes does go down, meaning that since that undersped the Valish, that's a free scavenger buff onto the Valish as well. So this is plus one, plus two, plus two, special attack, special defense, and then on top of that, some extra health on top, some extra health to boot. But the Doom comes down onto the Valish. This is pretty fantastic. My concern is there's a Kinu in the back. So this Kinu could, under the right circumstances, just uh, sacrifice and get rid of the Doom on Valish, leaving Trot with no other way to pursue that uh, win condition and losing him a lot as a result of that. Because basically, like, that was trading Adoro for the fact that Cage could have happened and then banking on the banking on the doom being enough there my problem with the doom here is that you've doomed a tem that it's just going to run a bloody swath through your team because this madness buff means that this crystal spike doesn't have to, doesn't have to stop and then after that it can like dust if it wants to as well and there's only uh yukama and a barn sheet there to help out poor uh leonardo here my big concern is what does Trot have left to hide behind in order to make sure this Doom goes off in time? I am unconvinced that he's going to have everything that he needs to be able to do this, but I could be wrong. Um, the big thing that we can see is basically like all of the money is in on the tort spot, uh, in on the Valish right now. So we see the cage come down, ref like stopping any potential swap there, which is pretty interesting to see. We see the Tortonite swap is caught from that. The Crystal Spikes comes down onto the Yukama, which takes it. But, oof, that's rough. The Water Cannon comes down onto the Tortonite, just getting a bit of chip onto it. It's something, as the Doom is ticking down for Valish. So this means that it's only going to have a single turn after this. I think that cage actually does cement the Valish dying. So then my question is, does Leonardo have what it takes to withstand the rest of its board? Trot has to make sure that it doesn't overexert, doesn't spend any of the um, HP of Tortonite, and also keep it sort of careful and uh, protected against this Valish. Like a Crystal Spikes onto the Tortonite, which Susanix does identify is the win condition, takes it down to 48 percent which is pretty big. The crystal does tanking out the Yukama as well. It's really all on that doom. Fortunately, the Tortonite did not get KO'd from all that. It's just had a bunch of damage on it. It's basically like a limp noodle in the back there, ready to get just taken down. And the result of this does mean that the Valish is not gonna have any way to remove this doom. The problem is like we can see how much Tor Trot has sacrificed as a result of this. So, right, this Crystal Dust is just going to straight up murder this Barn Sheet. I don't see any other way to deal with that. And in the meantime, like, yeah, sure, there's Tortonite's down, but then, like, you have a Kinu and a Nesla to deal with after this fact. That's still a lot to put on the plate of Port Tort. Um, we do know that it's Drill Nesla, so that you could just Doom the Nesla, I suppose. That is one op opportunity for this. As the Cage comes down again, just to get another defensive buff on to Leonardo. That's just fantastic. So we see the energy manipulation go down onto Tortonite, trying to make sure that um, that just goes down and there doesn't need to be any more damage taken care of onto it, as the Crystal Spikes actually goes down on the Tortonite instead. The Doom hits, and this does mean that Morgana is free to throw aggression into the Kinu that's going to be coming out. Now, this actually makes sense from Shizunix, because you basically, like, the Tortonite wins the game at this point. And Trot knows that, Shizunix knows that. This is a raid boss Tortonite. It's up to plus th four, plus three. It's pretty intimidating. And it only has 18% now, thanks to the Madness buff aggression from the Valish. This could still be winnable for Shizunix because of the aggression that he's thrown into that town. I do think that he needs to keep everything that is alive right now still alive, and I think that's going to be kind of a tall order, because uh, the Nestla is going to be the first thing to go down here, and I'm pretty sure that Trot's just going to throw a tornado into this Kinu spot as well, unless it's like Bamboozle. The other thing he could do here is Bamboozle Leonardo, but we already know that's a Drill Nestla, so you just don't do that. 
So, the Barnshee still getting to live is fantastic. It will get to live exactly one turn, get the tornado off, a beta burst comes down into the Tortonite, just throwing some chip damage at our boy. The Thunderstrike coming down onto Barnshee, immediately taking it out. So the next question is, can the plus one plus one protect against this? But the Tortonite's Garden comes out instead. Trot knows that it's going to take a lot from both of uh, these Thames on Shizenix's side to actually take him down. In the meantime, the heal is still really valuable. He overexerts just a tiny bit, but this is still really close. Uh, we could see a sacrifice from the Kinu here, which makes a lot of sense. It gets rid of the first slot of Doom, but then we're just stuck back into our, like, oh, do we get a uh, Crystal Spikes into this? Oh, do we get a uh, Strangle back or something like that? I don't think anyone runs Strangle on Nestle, but it's still, a, it's still a possibility. So instead, we're just going to see the Planks away at the Great Wall of Turtle, which looks like it's actually going to be enough as Trot's stuck in that awkward position where he wants even more health than he actually has, and he's stuck dooming a Tim that's actually going to be doing more damage to him than he really wants, despite being put into the right setup for this, the chip damage that happened onto Tortonite from the previous terms is actually enough to take it down. Shizenix takes game two. And that is why you cr don't crystal spikes a Barnshee. Well played to Shizenix, taking this game in fantastic fashion and turning the match on its head despite everything Trot did to cement that final matchup. Just a stellar game. And with that, I'm going to thank everybody for their time. I've been Quarter, and I hope everybody enjoyed this match. This does mean that Shizenix gets three points onto this cir onto this circuit so far. Uh, we have a variety of other matches coming up today, so please stay tuned and have a lovely one.
Hello and welcome back to this, our second game of SMVid, yes, that SMVid, versus Cielo Aoi. So, um, let's see if SMVid can take it back in this second game. And yeah, I'm pretty excited to see what's going on here. So we do see uh, a lot of fire aggression out of SMVid's side. We also see a wild Acronox pick, always really cool. And once again, the Golzi that we've seen almost every fellow Tamers player play. Uh, in the meantime, Cielo's got a pretty balanced team. We see a Vulcran in there. I would have loved to see that pop off. I only see so many of those. Uh, we see a Scaravolt. We see otherwise a lot of conventional threats. We see the Nagais. We see the Oziara. We see a Mooflank. Uh, wonder if that's Hurryward. A lot of people are running Hurryward at the moment. Uh, we see the Akronox get picked as well. So that's going to be really cool. So... We don't see a lot of other toxics to get that shot off here, thanks to the uh, Mashuk being banned as well. So this means that it's likely going to have to be the one-two combo. But one thing we can notice here is there's an abundance of Earth types. We have a Drakash, we have a Grumper, both of which are not seen as commonly at the moment. So it should be interesting seeing what SMFID gets up to. Uh, right, so the other flip side, of course, of a team like this is... Uh, that's a lot of things that died to OCR, and Cielo Aoi is definitely noticing that as he well into that. That could be a double hurry wart field as well, so SMV has to be very careful about what he puts into there. With the two toxics... weather this opener but uh after that the Golzi gets banned out that's one thing that can deal with the earths and the uh waters on Cielo Aoi's side so it's just sort of uh limiting the aggression one other concern there is banning the Nagais after then p choosing to pick the Valish allowing the fire Koish through something of a controversial decision out of SMFID there which when you've got like uh I mean I suppose you do have the two toxics there but given you've got all the things that are weak to water letting one of those through that doesn't then also die to your Grumper or your Valish is a bit curious. But I'm sure that SMFID has a plan. Uh, the, the dude was nothing less than the sterling camera person of the entirety of Fellow Tamers, so he's, they've definitely got a lot coming into things. So, as we continue onwards here, uh, we're just getting into the end of this draft. I'm sorry if there's uh, some official technical difficulties on stream there. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be doing these play-by-plays by audio for a little bit. My sincere apologies as uh, we get into this opening field of Acronox, Calibus, 
versus OCR on move flank. So this is the second game versus uh, Cielo Aoi and SM Fid. Cielo Aoi did take the first game. Let's see if SM Fid can take this into a 1-1, which we've seen a couple other games do. Um, or if Cielo can actually wind up taking this back. We've got a lot of uh, love for uh, fellow tamers in chat at the moment. Always a delightful thing to see. And honestly, right, so my concern here is an Aquatic Whirlwind and a Goring could very well just take out this Acronox if it's not sturdy enough. Um, like, you don't see Book Lungs, and I don't really respect Book Lungs. But what we can do see is, in fact, that early aggression, just going straight into it, going for the Aquatic Whirlwind, which do does bring the Acronox down to 63.9%. The Sting comes back in on the OCR trapping it in so that does mean that this is looking like a trade ocr for uh acronox because this does mean that even if the venom spread does not hit next turn because it is within goring range since the base jump was used instead conserving the priority on the move flank we still have a calibus that is more than happy to just toxic ink this horse so yeah, it's looking like a reasonable trade there. I think that that's not a trade you don't want to do if you're uh, SM feed, because then like, you know, you, you've got your Acronox. Acronox is fine into a lot of things here, but at the same time, like you want to get rid of this OCR. The OCR just full body tackles your back line. Funky How doesn't like it. Grumper doesn't like it. Koish doesn't like it. Excellent name of the Valish, by the way. As um, yeah, just looks like kind of a rough thing there. I'm also noticing a theme in the naming conventions of fellow tamers with their uh, Calibus. I'm wondering if there's an inside joke there. Kind of fun to see. So we do see Funky How hit the field. And the Goring does come in trying to confirm that kill. And mother of God, that went straight down almost 60% just off of the Goring. That is a terrifying move flank out of Cielo or alternately an absurdly frail Valish. Probably a combination of the two. Uh, we can assume in that case, we've I think we've seen a couple other physical Valish out of fellow tamers. Could be that we're seeing another one out of SM feet as well. But um, the tr like the trade isn't very successful for Cielo there as uh, SM Fit does reposition. The Fire Koish, on the other hand, alongside the move flank is kind of a scary board for this regardless. Like. This Valish is not in a comfy position. There aren't too many things that want to come into this either. Like, the mind game now is, do I Ketsa or do I just Water Cannon? The Water Cannon deals with everything that wants to swap in comfortably. Acronox still doesn't take Water Cannons well at 25%. You just don't deal with that. So what's more likely that we're going to see here is just Funky How charge headlong into this. Problem is, I don't think that's actually a good idea. Fire Koish could be something to swap in, though. And Cielo realizes that. Dropping the cage down. Does this trap it? Yes, it does. The Valish is stuck in as the Quetzalenio comes down like a mighty force. We saw how much damage that Goring did. There was no chance that that Quetzalenio from 63% was not going to be taking that Valish down. There's a bit of retribution that comes out with the Toxic Ink thanks to the cage, meaning that the Fire Koish is likely going to be going down, but probably not before it claims another victim, or at least carves another hole into this team. This move flank Koish combo appeared to be very offensively specced out of Cielo Aoi. So... Looking into this, I kind of still like the Fire Quish coming in here instead, just because I don't think Acronox gets up to enough. You could try Acronox and try to outspeed, but I think you have to be very fast to beat this lead. Um, it looks like Cielo's definitely specced these boys to hit hard and quick. So uh, with the lower base speed of Acronox, I think it's going to be a tall order ensuring that your Venom spread does outspeed. But if it does, then that's basically just a death sentence to the Quish. As we can see, dropping in the Grumper instead definitely signposts that he wasn't confident that that Acronox was going to outspeed this opener, uh, or rather this uh, position as it is. And uh, given the fact that the Acronox is probably going to be going down to some priority here, you just don't let that happen. And instead, we get a nice big old fat Grumper on the field. Chamomile Grumper, classic Trident True Tech, uh, stops you from overexerting to the uh, Thunder Strike is bad thanks to removing the uh, exhaust. So that's just, you know, just, just good stuff. Now, it's still going to be taking a boatload of damage here. Water Cannon and Base Jump is still kind of a nightmare. Like, you're going to hit back. Oh, it's the Goring as well. That brings it down to 62%. That's still a mighty chunk off of the move flank there we see the ice cubes come down as well getting it down to 27 percent with the war drum off of course that was without synergy as well that's really frightening still though the trade does wind up happening again as the uh 
Firequish goes down alongside that. So that's two temps down on Cielo Aoi's side and a strangle down onto the move flank with a Grumper on the board. The Volfi swap in though is kind of a nightmare. Uh, so Volfi single-handedly deals with everything else in uh, SM Fitz back line now, right? Because uh, Grumper dies to Plague. Firequish does not like Plague or Dust Vortex. It can hit back, but it doesn't hit, hit back hard enough. Like, I think what SM Fitz just kind of has to do now is accept the fact that Grumper's done its job and that you tech right either that or you swap in the acronox like my, my concerns here are that volfi probably might act well volfi can take a ton of damage from uh koish but you gotta have koish come in safely i would have actually conserved the grumper because the grumper was better against scaravolt as opposed to acronox which is technically an earth tem but doesn't have a lot of good earth options but we do see smvid winds up sacking the grumper just willing to let it go down so that way the fire koish can come in safely because lava wave will still hit still hit this field like a truck and the combination of lava wave and toxic ink should be enough to take down this volfi now the next question is does Cielo let him get that? Scaravolt could easily come in here, and Scaravolt eats both of those hits very comfortably, especially if this is Chamomile. Uh, we don't know if this is a half full or good friend. If it's half full, then we could see a number of defensive items on it. Cielo doesn't even blink. He goes straight for the jugular. The fire, the lava wave comes out onto the move flank instead when the Volfi is still full health and very frightening into the back line of SM Fit as the Koish just gets plagued down. That's very unfortunate to see. If that aggression wasn't split, we may have seen more damage onto this Volfi and I'd feel a little more comfortable about the position of SM Fit going into the late part of this game. But in the meantime, honestly, uh, Cielo's looking in, like they're in a good spot here. The Akronox hasn't been touched. It's perfectly capable of swapping in right now to stop the Venom spread from coming down on the Volfi. In the meantime, the move flank's just kind of vibe you know, there's still you still have to hit the move flank, otherwise it's just gonna get a cheeky execution off, and nobody wants that. So we do see a sting just land down. Uh, no venom spread. Perhaps they were expecting the swap, which I, I can't necessarily disagree with that. But that unfortunately means that one of the best tools to deal with the Volfi does go down to a suicide charge from the move flank as the plague lands onto Paul the Octopus right here. As, uh, yeah, no, going down to 30% from fit, roughly 55 from a plague and then taking the OX is pretty gruesome. With the Scaravolt hitting the field completely fresh faced, this is looking like a big old win. Force Yellow Owie here against. SM Fit, I don't see any way that SM Fit can come back from this. We do see that it is half full baton pass, a very popular combination. This, of course, giving you the immediate buffs onto the Scaravolt with uh, less of the immediate downside. And with that, Cielo Aoi takes it in a 2-0. Well played to SM Fit regardless. Great seeing fellow teamers getting onto the scene, but congratulations for Cielo Aoi who gets three points into the circuit in this engagement. Wonderful to see. And with that, we just kind of wonder, I'm um, just going to quickly check with our organizers to see if there's any more matches that we'll be casting inside this. Uh, definitely great to see those matches, though. Oh, yes, we do have a couple more looking like they're coming up uh, very shortly. I believe we have Tsubaki-chan and Wiki Colonel, followed by Ali and Cielo Aoi later on in the day. I'm afraid that uh, I won't necessarily be able to be here for all of those casts, but I do hope everybody enjoys them regardless. That being said, what we can do right now is just check to see uh, whether Tsubaki and Wiki Colonel are ready to get into their game or if that's going to take a bit of time. It does look like that's scheduled for a bit away from now, given that their slot is uh, in roughly an hour.
Oh, there we are. Never mind. It's been uh, clear. Clearly, I can't read, and it is on. Well, in that case, uh, do hang tight because Tsubaki Chan versus Wiki Colonel is definitely going to be a really cool engagement. Wiki Colonel has been by far one of my favorite people to spectate inside these upcoming matches. Um, having managed to take down Neko Blocky in pretty short order, and uh, despite a drubbing from Srizen and the very aggressive digital team that they had, so they're still bringing a lot of sauce to this tournament. Um, I, I'm really fond of the amount of love fellow tamers is showing Golzi, and I really hope that they keep flexing that muscly boy. Um, it, it just doesn't get the respect that anyone would have ex anticipated that it could have, and it's nice seeing somebody make it work. So with that, uh, in, in no small time, we should have our match between Subaki chan and Wicked Colonel. Please hang tight till then. Thank you so much for checking in.
Hello, hello, and welcome back to this Artem Team Cup May Edition. Right, well, once again, we've got a treat for you. This would this treat, of course, it's Subaki Chun versus Wiki Colonel. Now, Subaki Chun, uh, you may have heard of him. He's, he's something of a big name, something of a cottage industry. Uh, definitely one of the uh, most skilled players in the game at this moment in time. Exotic French player at the moment, and just generally a pretty cool dude. Check out their channel. They're, they're generally a pretty cool person and are known for a uh, specific style of tactics that tend to involve slowing the game down and forcing the opponent to misplay, capitalizing on any lost ground that they make. In the meantime, though, Wiki Colonel coming out of the woodworks like nobody's business and fellow, fellow tamers generally surprising me uh, with some pretty fantastic plays. Uh, Wiki Colonel, of course, being the uh, fellow tamers member that punched out Neko Blocky in this group stage, not something that I expected whatsoever. So it'll be interesting to see if they can do that again versus Tsubaki Chan. Their team is pretty reasonable into a non-aggressive lineup, in my opinion. Those kinds of mid-range teams can be less uh, capable of responding to aggro, but definitely more capable of responding to things that are equally low tempo. So once our uh, fine players get into their match, we'll be able to find out precisely how they fare into each other. Uh, we did get a small glimpse of Tsubaki last night as they uh, went up against Rizen, and that did seem to go very much in their favor as well. They're rocking a very toxic-oriented lineup, which I do think is fairly strong at the moment, in stymieing some of the aggression that people are making. A lot of people going Fire Koish, a lot of people going Osiara, and a lot of sorts of things which uh, generally are, you know, caught in the action by a lot of toxics like Calibus, like Mashuk, like Valorand, which never really went down. I'm super impressed by that. Obviously, it's not, it, it definitely requires a lot more protection and the stamina, the stamina nerf definitely hit it hard, but it's a uh, far cry from where it used to be. And it's definitely not out of the, but like, despite that, it's not out of the game at all. I think a lot of people are just expecting it to cease to exist. But we see a lot of them. And with that, we are in our game. Just hopped in. And yeah, just going to wait for uh, stream to catch up there before I really start getting into the detail here. But rest assured, I, I think this is going to be an interesting draft. I think that um, the goal C that Wiki Colonel is presenting here, it, that, that actually t eats the band. That's really impressive. Not something I expected to see out of Tsubaki Chan. Res the respect of the goal Z that carved the other game apart. And yeah, no, generally just pretty interesting to see. Uh, we see the Nagai's ban out of Wiki Colonel as a res like uh, in response. Uh, I, I think I can get behind this once again. I think the Valish is also a re an appropriate response, especially given that there isn't much to deal with a lot of these toxic Thames on Wiki Colonel's team, unless we're just going hard Kinu Yowler into this. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'll get to see the Shween as well. Perhaps not, because I still have suspicions that that Shween is there to help enable this Nagai's, but. I'm not entirely sure what else that could be doing on this team. Sacrificing into the Valish is always another possibility there. Uh, Shween is a startlingly versatile support Tim, and it also protects against that Digi Threat style team that we've been seeing a little more of in the corners of things. Still, though, looking back at this actual game, we do see a Valish first pick out of Wiki Colonel. This gives a bit of versatility to this field. We could see a Fire Koish. It's unlikely to see a Fire Koish into a Calibus and a potential Mashuk on top of that. I do like the Kinu as a second pick here. Obviously, Kinu Valish is very strong. And um, it would leave space for Tsubaki's own... While it would leave space for Tsubaki's own Valish, I think that there's plenty of other things that can be done here. Now, if you, if you want to play hardball, 
what else could have happened there is go to go for like the Mimit as well for like double Valish. I think that's like your big play because you can only target one of those slots down. That basically guarantees you a madness buff. That's that's some fire right there. But we see the we see the Kinu Valish anyways. This is a pretty reasonable field. It does mean that the Mashuk and the Calibus can kind of focus down this Valish though, which is what I'm worried about turn one here. Like the Kinu, I don't think we actually focus the Kinu of Tsubaki because you kind of just expect that to hop on out it's probably not going to stay into beta burst this mashuk because if it does then it's eating a wastewater and a tank which uh no self-respecting kinu would actually appreciate we see the yowler ban out of wiki kernel keeping the kinu which i think is uh surprising given how much uh tsubaki works well with that delightful swappy lad but you know it does mean that the one of the heaviest hitting threats out of tsubaki chan is not going to be seeing play right now leaving a valorand and a valish as the main sort of uh hard pushers inside this obviously this isn't this is not meaning to undersell the uh, offensive capacity of both calibus and mashuk it's more to the point that um out of, out of what's left to be picked, it looks like it's uh, mainly supports that are left outside of that. Like, uh, Mashuk is kind of one of those hybrid Thames. Like, I think Mashuk and Kala, you could kind of argue that they're not like your main damage dealers. Mashuk can definitely go swinging, but it's not like high end. Uh, one thing this does do, though, is it actually impedes the amount at which um, good aggression on digital can actually be done into this field, with only really the Mashuk hating that alongside the Kinu. So with this, we get into our turn one of Tsubaki Chen versus Wiki Colonel. And yeah, no, I'm really interested in how this plays out. Obviously, I think Kinu Valish is a very strong opener. I just think that Wiki Colonel has to respect the aggression that could be coming out of these very bulky Thames right now. Um, like a strangle into an uppercut would just be really bad for Valish. Hell, uh, same goes with the Toxic Ink. There's a lot of different things that this Calibus can do to be a massive nuisance on this board. And yeah, once again, um, uppercuts to the face from Mashuk are the sort of thing you don't want your Valish to just eat for no reason. The problem is now, we have to be aware, like if, if there's one thing that I think Tsubaki probably wouldn't be expecting is like the beta burst into Mashuk here. My problem with that is I don't think that takes it down. And I think that that's heavily gambling on Tsubaki reading the swap and just accepting the swap and just hard targeting the Valish this turn to ensure that it doesn't get the madness buff up. This is the kind of threat juxtaposition that can be fun to see though. So we do see the beta burst actually stay in, goes for the beta burst onto the Mashuk, does about, does takes it down to 63% and then the madness buff as well. So there we are, that's both sides of the aggression out onto the board, we see the perfect jab absolutely clobber that Valish, um, which does mean that the Toxic Ink gets it pretty low. Oh, uh, yeah. So, things to be concerned here. Obviously, if the Kinu swaps at this point, I think that's fine. I think you go for the Valish this turn if you're going to be doing that. But, um, we could equally see a Hedgin here. Hedgin eats the vast majority of the moves out of Calibus outside of a water jet. If it has that, usually it's either jet or isolactite. You don't tend to see both. There's an argument to be made for both, but I don't think it's necessary by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, a hedge in, in this board just scares away the mushroom even more. But I kind of prefer putting the Valish into the Kinu slot here, because this means that you can just get a cheeky second Valish. Helps out with the first Valish in terms of getting everything up and running, because it's very unlikely that this first Valish is going to live. Uh, you could swap this Valish out. It will live the Poison Tick, since Poison Ticks do 12.5, and this Valish is just cleanly at 14%. It will live on a Nat's fart of HP, but a Nat's fart is enough for Valish, and with a Madness buff, it could easily come back later on. Um... Uh, I think a Mashuk would be a fun thing to see. I don't know if it's the most powerful thing that um, Wiki Colonel could bring here. We do see Tsubaki bounce and swap into the Valorant, which is more than capable of eating special attacks. And the Valish stays, kind of sealing its own fate, but it still does over, um, over half of this Valorant's health. The H-Slap comes down as well, as this Valish is definitely taking a bunch of punishment, but it did not go down, which is the important thing this turn. Um, it's, st it's still more than capable of carving a bloody swath into Tsubaki's team for at least one more hit. 
Like, I don't think he actually wants to, anything else to swap in there. Um, obviously, Valorand is pretty valuable, but I don't think it's his most valuable Tem. Uh, I think he can afford to sack one of his toxic cores and still feel comfortably ahead here, provided that he, like, doesn't give any more ground outside of that. Like, you gotta take down the Valish. But uh, how do you take down the Valish? We see Swappy the Kinu hop in there on the Calibus spot, just making sure that this uh, Valorant feels that much safer on the board here. Just getting those plus one, plus ones on us. The Crystal Spikes does come down once again, and that does not secure the KO thanks to that. We do see the Hypnosis come down as well onto the Kinu. Unfortunate. Uh, that's risky even if the Calibus had stayed in, honestly, because a lot of Calibus do run... Um, energy drink so that would have been kind of a hard argument to make either way there the kinu buff however saving the valorand at 9.2 percent losing your valish without actually getting a ko is pretty frustrating because now the kinu can just heal up this uh valorand unless you immediately come in swinging even harder um now wiki kernel has things available to ensure that that's a possibility uh i i think double mimic right now while risky into a bunch of toxics is still totally possible my problem here is that calibus can swap right back into this valorant spot and just eat the lava wave so what's the secondary threat uh, a lot of times when you see these kinds of defenses in the background the thing that you have to bear in mind is like how do I, how do i make sure that no matter what i throw into this it doesn't feel like i've wasted a turn right Okay, so uh, we do see the double fire coish enter the board. We do see the Calibus actually land in the Kinu spot. Not something I expected there because I kind of expected this Valorant to be the thing that went down. Um, yeah, we do still see the Calibus on the board. That's obviously a very intimidating thing. And what this also means, ah, uh, yeah, no, that's what it is. It's getting the maximum value out of your Kinu. You want to make sure that thing's swapping in and out to make sure that you get the effective protector buffs onto your Thames when you can. And that is something that Tsubaki is always going to work on doing when people give him the opportunity to pick this Tem. So, uh, looking at this board, the next question is what's coming in on the Kinu spot? And the answer is Mashuk. Mashuk with Parrier just devours that board. So, honestly, it seems unlikely that Wiki Colonel would want to keep both of these Koish in. Swappy does its namesake as Boxroom does enter the board there on the Kinu spot. Just meaning that if there were any lava waves that were going into that, they are going to get hit by the parrier, and that is precisely what happens. The Hypnosis does come down as well onto the Calibus, and we'll have to see if that is energy drink. It is not energy drink. Well... There we go. That is some good value out of Wiki Kernel right there. Not having to worry about the Toxic Ink staring you in the face is always a fantastic thing. And it does look like a combination of Lava Waves might actually take down Box Room. Uh, yeah, no, this is a tighter spot for Tsubaki than one might have expected given the aggression that we've seen out of Wiki Kernel's team in this draft. So, looking at this... What do we have to expect out of Tsubaki-chan? My question is... My question is, what is this Mashuk doing in time? I suppose the real thing here. Oh, no, no, I have the answer. The answer is you, sw you swap Kinu. Easy. Um, if you get a Kinu buff onto this Mashuk, it's likely to have enough HP to live both of those lava waves and get the clean wastewater onto uh, most likely the Mimit. I tend to say you target the Mimit in these scenarios because the Mimit is often spread on offensive teams like this to be a bit more frail than its counterpart. This obviously Obviously a gamble, sometimes people go HP speed, but um, I think that's a worthy thing to scout, if nothing else as well, for Tsubaki-chan, he doesn't already have that knowledge. As expected, we do see Swappy right, right back into this board. Super easy to see right there, getting the Kinu buff off, making sure it can survive those lava waves. And getting it down to 17.1% with the OX on the main Koish means that this Mashuk might actually survive after all. Yes, with the Kinu buff, it does live at an even 1.3%, meaning it is able to get half damage off onto the Mimit. Not quite the KO we were expecting there, but I'm assuming that this is in fact a thick mushroom. Uh, we have seen that it is Parrier, so this obviously like is a much more concerted uh, 
resilient sort of uh, resisty boy that's there to, you know, block a bunch of physical hits, which is entirely what it's doing here. It is being able to withstand the aggression of double fire course that is keeping Subaki into this game. So, looking at this, what's going to happen next? Now, my assumption here is that you just let the Mashuk die. One of the fire koish has overexerted. So, there's there is an argument to be made here for like swapping the Mashuk at this point, but I I don't know. I feel like a Mashuk at 1.3% has done its job. And we see Wiki Colonels uh taking some notes here as they actually buff up their own Mimit quickly getting a Kinu swap out there as uh, Boxstrom does in fact retreat to the back, expecting a, another lava wave to come out there as the uh, water cannon hits Flying Oct for absolutely nothing. That is under 4%, attempting the love tap, but instead getting hard punished by it. Imagine if that was a lava wave onto the Kinu. This is the power of mind games at this point, right? Expecting the Kinu to swap all the times and then suddenly turning on a dime and just like keeping it on the board, making sure that it gets a stone wall off instead, taking advantage of the fact that your, you, your opponent has been anticipating these swaps consistently all through. So... Yeah, this is a bad footing for uh, Wiki Colonel now. Uh, I, I don't know what they do to take down Flying Oct. It's going to be an actual monster. Uh, I, I, one thing that could be done here is just let it overexert while trying to, you know, throw its damage away on things that aren't as painful into it. Because Hedgen still loves this board. But the problem is Hedgen still has to worry about that water um, jet that's still very much available. And as we've seen, the Kinu obviously outspeeds Acalibus. And I'm still surprised to see less sleep protection on slower Thames as of late. But I'm sure that will change in the upcoming times. There's a lot of gear slots that are still very much up in the air. But I, I, I don't know. This is a personal thing, but I always feel like you want that energy drink on a slower Tem like this. Obviously, in a team like Tsubaki's, you have a bunch of different opportunities for that, though. So there's no telling whether that sleep protection item is on something else on the team. In the meantime, though, it has been an absolute impediment to them pressuring with this Calibus when they want to. And getting those Hypnos off when it's possible has been so valuable for Wiki Colonel. So we see the Plasma Beam go down on the Valish. It's not very much damage at all. But the sharpening comes out. Is this a physical Valish? That's very interesting to see. So it seems like it's the sort of uh, turning on the fast gear right there. So with uh, plus basically the equivalent of half full buff there. Um, yes, plus one to all stat. Uh, no, not quite. It's speed rather than special attack. I just see four green arrow, uh, four green triangles, and I think half full. But. Uh, now, this Valish is looking pretty intimidating. I also still don't think it wants to stare down a board full of fires. So what this does look like is the swap into two Toxics again, debating the aggression, but no, the Valish stays out and actually hammers into this fire coish. The fire tornado coming down on the Valish, probably alongside the Quetzalanio. This is quite the bluff, but what's it gonna wind up being? It's a double into the Valish perhaps expecting the Kinu aggression, swapping out the box from his kill fodder, but in this, in, instead the Valish goes down, Wiki Colonel sees through the aggression, but still has this Calibus to take down, and it's a monster. Uh, it also has a clear shot onto this hedge, and unless this Koish is packing uh, Hypnosis to deal with it, we've seen that Sleep Control has been a great way for Wiki Colonel to make sure that they don't have to take this Calibus to the face, the Water Jet, the Toxic Ink, all of these things are very dread, sort of uh, dreadful for them. But uh, if they continue to just Sleep Control at opportune moments there, Koish obviously outspeeding, then that could be really valuable here, and that gives Wiki Colonel the space to knock down Box Room. The problem is, uh, it's still plus three, plus two, onto a Calibus that is more than capable of tearing apart this field. We see the Hellfire go down instead, getting the burn off on the Calibus, which does mean that it's most likely that this Koishi is not going to be using Hypnosis, but instead we do see the Hypnosis taking advantage of the fact that the Mucus means that the burn does not happen, meaning there's no way to wake it up this turn, which would otherwise happen. That's really interesting to see. And once again, it saves the Hedgen from an untimely death. But this does mean that now we are up to a monolithic 
plus four plus three on this Calibus. Just a truly absurd amount of buffs on there. It is going to take a lot to bring this Calibus down. And in the meantime, it can hit roughly anything pretty hard out of Wiki Colonel's field, right? The Toxic Inks are there for the Kinu. The um, Water Jet is there for the Hedgen. The Toxic Inks are also there for the Fire Koish and whatever the Mimit is as well. This is, this could so quickly swap in the other direction, but man, Wiki Colonel is taking ground. So my big curiosity here is whether this Kinu attempts to present itself in an aggressive manner. If it does, awesome. I think it can probably beta out the Koish from here uh, or get some reasonable chip on the Mimit. But what I expect is for the Kinu to quickly grab a cheeky buff onto the Hedgen. And then, like, I don't know. That would mean that the Hedgen has to stay in and overexert. I'm not entirely sure I'm okay with that because you really want all your HP against this thing. There is an there is a counter argument to say that, like, you know, any hit onto Hedgen basically takes it down unless it gets the Generify up. And we have yet to see a Generify out of Wiki Colonel's Hedgen. So we do not know if it's actually running that admittedly pretty powerful tech. Okay. So. The Koish does bounce. We do see the Kinu come in to buff up the Hedgen. And then what's this, what's this Hedgen gonna wind up doing? Yes, it does just go straight for the Plasma Beam onto the Kinu, just trying to get some good damage out before anything else. The Beta Burst comes down into the Kinu slot. The Kinu eats that like a champ. It appears to be a fairly bulky Kinu. The burn does not take down the Kinu, meaning that there's gonna be at least one more turn where there can't be aggression thrown onto Flying Oct. And this does also leave Tsubaki open with the opportunity of getting a sacrifice off. Sacrifice is always a thing you wanna do with near-dead Kinus. The three prio means that it's very hard for your opponent to interrupt, and it's just really good. The challenge here is... Okay, so I believe that... Yeah, no, there's no way that Hedgen didn't overexert. It was basically at no stamina last turn, so it cannot attack this turn. So we do see the Hedgen swap. This makes perfect sense. We see the Fire Quish come down instead, probably just to eat the Water Jet. It doesn't feel like it's going to do well into that. The Sacrifice does come down. There was no way uh, for Flying Oct to deal with that. Oh, no, but does that leave it open to another Hypno turn? Ah, oh, that would have been such a cool play out of Wakey, but instead we see a Beta Burst just plank into it. Which absolutely gets bodied by that Toxic Ink, and this is where the problem comes in, right? This Calibus is pretty full stamina because it's being slept, it's been being slept the entire game, but oh no, a Challenger approaches! Will a Mimit Calibus be able to deal with this since the Kinu is now down? If there was a if there was a Kinu to buff up this Mimit, I would feel better about this. But at this point, uh, is it enough? We see the Hypnosis this turn come out. And it looks like it might very well be what is being suggested here. But my only challenge with that is how do you then get an appropriate amount of pressure out on this board? The Hypnosis Strangle Lock would be pretty intimidating if that's what's going to happen here. Is that going to be maneuvered effectively? It's going to take a while if it does. And in the meantime, I believe there's still an out for Tsubaki where they can get like one or two attacks off inside of that. But we see the Generify come down. Maybe this is trying to bait out some stamina as the Water Jet does hit into the Hedgen. Thanks to the Generify, it is not enough. The Strangle comes down with the Doppelganger brooch. That's actually still like, I, I say reasonable damage because this is a plus five, plus five mega octopus at this point. This is the Kraken. The Plasma Beam comes down. Thanks to the Mucus, it is not going to be taking burn takes, but it's just, you know, pecking away at this. But, um, yeah, it's kind of a question mark. Still, though, I suppose it's better to get some aggression out with Hedgen now if you know that you still have your tool of, um, 
Hypnosis and Strangle in the back. It does look like we're getting a couple more out here and there. The Generify wearing off before the Toxic Ink can really go down. Um, although obviously that's also because the water jet's on hold and that's a really hard thing to work with. In the meantime, we get that we get the Koish back out there, getting some more Hypno Strangle going on. As it looks like Wiki Colonel might actually be in a position to take this game one. Yeah, so looking at this, the challenge here is that the action economy is not there from Tsubaki. At this point, we can just see a perpetual lock of hypnosis into strangle into hypnosis that just isn't re achievable at this point, which can turn 30 it, as a matter of fact. So this being turn 21, that's not going to take too much time. There's only nine turns left. And this means that you just strangle into hypnosis, into strangle into hypnosis. Since there's only one turn of alert, that that can be uh, waited out inside the strangle time. But uh, we'll have to see how this goes in terms of this. So, unfortunately, due to the fact that there's no other time available, this is something that we've seen Tsubaki fall into before in terms of a pitfall, which is, you know, uh, having a Tem that just will not go down is a fantastic win condition. The, oh, no. Jumping the gun on the strangle here means that Wiki Colonel was also able to get a strangle off. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tsubaki Chen was also able to get a strangle off. But is that going to be enough there? Oh, hold on. How did it move? I'm actually very confused as to what happened there. Normally, if that strangle goes down, I don't expect the Koish to be able to move after that unless a turn quickly happened in short succession after that that we all just didn't see, which was like a double rest, uh, a like full rest turn or something like that. That's a possibility that happened there. That happened in another match that I was casting recently. But in the meantime, we're stuck back in this position where really Wiki Colonel, Wiki Colonel's just waiting things out at this point. There's a pretty good lock going down onto this board, stopping Tsubaki from being able to foment too much aggression unless there's an active misplay by Wiki Colonel. And we're still seeing them bounce around here and try to like get more cheeky damage off when really they don't need to. All this is doing is uh, reaffirming the fact that, like, you know, you just got to play it out and play it right, and then you don't have these sorts of problems. But uh, they're still trying to get that cheeky KO off there, just trying to get it out early. But all that's doing is making them lose ground, trying to chip away at this colossal squid of death that Tsubaki has crafted over the course of this game. And with that, we get our triple rest turn. The hypnosis comes down before the calibus, before the calibus can act. And we're back into that position where immediately after this, we can get ourselves a strangle. If there was a rainbow guard here, obviously that'd be the other fantastic thing to see. But uh, what we need to see out of Wiki Colonel is uh, just like making sure that you know, nothing else happens to disrupt his board state. Nothing else happens that would get um, this Koish into a bad scenario. Just gotta wait out the timer a little bit. Now the problem with that is that still leaves one turn for Tsubaki to act each time. But if this is just like, you know, a heavy damage attack from Koish into that, uh, I say heavy damage, like Lava Wave is going to do enough, but that does actually bring it down to 41.2%, which is not enough to fully contest that. A uh, little bit of extra chip damage from the Calibus, and this very much could just be it. The Doppelganger Brooch also massively increasing the damage there, bringing it down to 368 That said, this is very down to the wire. I've seen many games that are 
playing the turn 30 go down to the last bit and there we are using just a little bit of positioning wiki colonel squeezes out a victory against subaki chan in this first game that was incredibly close so once again the challenge there really was the fact that the misdirection only works in certain places there and uh, tsubaki relied on a couple hard reads there that didn't wind up paying off right expecting uh, basically, like one of the key turns was expecting Wiki Colonel to target the Kinu and swapping that in onto, well, swapping the Mushrik in on that when the Valish was the point of focus instead was so important for Wiki Colonel and really helped him bring the game back. Um, as a result of that, the rest of it kind of fell in because at that point, really all that Tsubaki had was an impenetrable Calibus of Doom, which never died but did not win him the game. Well, that with this, we head pretty quickly into the next game. Just going to check and see if our contestants are ready. Looks like we're going to be having a five minute break before our next game, making sure that both of our contestants are refreshed and ready for their next encounter. So with that, I will be right back. Uh, do stay tuned. Obviously, I'm, I'm awaiting with bated breath for our second game between Tsubaki Chen and Wiki Colonel. Wiki Colonel has been surprising us consistently inside this particular group stage. So I, I hope they make a repeat performance of that. You know, no pressure. In the meantime, though, catch you all in just a moment.
welcome back. And we're just getting into our second of our best of two uh, between Tsubaki Chen and Wiki Colonel. Once again, I was pretty surprised by the degree to which Wiki Colonel, uh, Wiki Colonel um, circumvented the very beefy Thames out of Tsubaki Chan's side. Here we are, we're just getting into the game now. And the question is, are the pick bands going to wind up being different than they were last time? We saw Tsubaki give a ton of respect to Golzi, which obviously can do a lot to carve into Tsubaki's lineup. But the question is, is that going to wind up being respect that's maintained? Are we going to see something swap up there? The Hedgen did a lot that game, all things considered, as did the Fire Quash and the Mimit. Uh, we do see the Nagai's ban once again out of Wiki Colonel. Definitely doesn't appear to want to face down the Deceit Aura with his team. Obviously, this makes a lot of sense. Hedgen pretty much melts in a Deceit Aura environment. Really cannot function as you want it to. My question is, what's Tsubaki going to wind up banning instead? Is it going to still be the Golzi? Is it going to wind up being something else? I'm kind of surprised that we didn't see more uh, support bans out of him. Uh, obviously, Tsubaki is a player that winds up very much respecting Kinu. We saw how well he used his that game, and we do see the Kinu ban come out there. That makes a lot of sense. So... Going into our first picks here, it does look like uh, Wiki Colonel just goes straight into the Valish. Uh, we've seen a lot of aggressive physical Valish out of fellow Tamers players. I don't actually remember if this is the same one, um, but we'll have to wind up seeing. So in the meantime, uh, obviously a Valish can be countered by a bunch of different things inside here. The Mashook is still a really easy thing to just throw in front of that. We have um, Tsubaki's own Valish, which is more than capable of handling that as well, with its really terrifying aggression. Much more speed than we expect out of that, but instead, no, we see the tried and true, the classic Kinu Yowler enter the stage here. So this is likely a Valish Fire Koish. It is a Valish Fire Koish going into this. Quite impressive to see. So this is going to be a lot of directed aggression. Once again, the question is, is this going to be some misdirection out of Tsubaki? We're going to see anything that would uh, break the mold here in terms of trying to split off damage from Wiki Colonel. Because anytime that Kinu slot isn't tar anytime the Kinu slot's not being targeted, then um, it's likely that it's going to try to do something of value on the field. The problem is it is a very risky thing as we saw last game. One false step inside that and suddenly you lose a ton. We see the Mashook ban out of Tsubaki Chen as well. So that's two support oriented Thames on Wiki Colonel's side band. Makes a lot of sense to see. And in the meantime, what's our second ban gonna wind up being from Wiki Colonel? Uh, we do see the Mashook ban as well. The Mashook caused him a lot of trouble last game. This makes a lot of sense. The Yowler was also picked this time. So that seemed to be the other thing that he really wanted to get out of the picture here. So seeing it first picked means that that ban was kind of a bit more open. We see the Mim it picked on wiki kernel side makes a lot of sense we've seen that be used to great effect alongside the koish and a bunch of other terrifying things um yeah i'm interested in seeing how the goals he winds up working inside this given there's no kinu to support at this game uh hedgen and yowler i kind of actually prefer the yowler here and it looks like there's another reason why that schween's getting picked here if this is a guardian schween that means that's basically free hibernates if Tsubaki can get them off at the right time. So yeah, we do see the hedging get picked up by Wiki Colonel, so that'll be a pretty fun thing to see. Some very fast-paced aggression out of Wiki Colonel can be expected this game, but will Tsubaki Chen bring it back with the tried and true Kinu Yowler and some very powerful support Thames in the back alongside some just chunky options? So... In our turn one, obviously, you know, I, it would be remiss of us to not expect a show off out of Yeller. It is always a powerful thing to see it do. In this instance, it's not like, obviously, you have to be aware of uh, turn one punishment. Both of these Tims can heavily output damage, and you don't necessarily want to leave a Valish ready to set up as well, depending on what kind it is. But, uh... 
we do see the Shween just hop right back in, hop right in here, ready to uh, protect this Yowler from potential sleep or anything else there or any other status that's coming down. But we do see a ton of aggression go down into it as the Crystal Spikes and the Kretzelenio hit it for rough, like almost half of its health. It's down to 59.8%. That's a reasonable amount right there, especially given that that's turn one aggression into a Yowler. Definitely known for being able to weather a ton. Still, though, the show off is up. The bear is online, and the double screen is showing that once again, we're seeing a lot of disrespect towards sleep, uh, sleep options. And since the Kinu's been banned, there's only the Fire Koish available to provide sleep options. Now, that said, I do think that that is something that Tsubaki needs to be careful about here. Um, um, the Camomile does not protect, sorry, the Guardian Schween does not protect against sleep, so it should be fairly easy for Wiki Colonel to Hypno that Yowler and take care of it that way if that's an option that they choose to go for. In the meantime, that leaves the Valish basically free to Madness buff, which is also very frightening that we've seen that this is indeed a special Valish. Still, though, uh, another question is, does Tsubaki just swap here? It's not camo. He's more than able to swap out his uh, Yowler and just put in the Calibus there or something like that. Uh, a lot of questions there. Uh, another thing that we... Okay, I don't expect to see the Valish to swap in. It would be the Calibus if we are expecting a swap in. But in the meantime, it could be very easy just to see like an Oshi Dashi for comeback or go straight down onto this Valish, punishing aggression from Wiki if they choose to just go hard into this Yowler this turn. And yeah, no, that's that's about what I expect out of this turn. We'll have to see what winds up going down. I don't really know what to expect from Schween, but I think a lot of people can say that. Since it's Camo Schween, we do have the option of a relaxed turn actually still available to us. But instead, we see the Schween bounce, most likely for Swappy, our best friend, once again, entering the board here, getting another plus one, plus one onto Yaller before it either stays in and weathers the assault that's uh, going into it or just bounces. We'll have to see which one that is. It looks like the v Crystal Spikes is coming down into this, and thanks to the plus two, plus two, that is a lot easier for it to weather. The uh, Quetzalenio coming down as well is still gonna do a reasonable amount, but it'll eat that. It's down to 22.28.2%, oh, and thanks to the comebacker, this is gonna hit like an absolute truck, just eviscerating the fish. And there goes the only sleep control available to Wiki Colonel. a very frightening thing to see. So, right, how do we bring this back as Wiki Colonel? My first thought is, Hedgen's honestly still not bad here. You, you can generify into things, you can just throw plasma beams out, which in, which definitely do a lot to hurt the Ginu. Um, instead, we see the Golzi come in. Now, I don't know, Golzi feels a little fragile in front of Yaller, but I suppose it is still a very, very aggressive Tem that can take a lot of punishment. Well, it, I don't know about taking punishment, but it can, it can dish a lot of punishment. The Kinu swaps again as Swappy earns its namesake as instead we see the Schween bounce in to protect the Yeller and potentially give it its hibernate since this is the hibernate turn. So we see the crystal spikes go down, the sparkling bullet hits as well, and the sparkling bullet isn't enough, the hibernate will be going down this turn. And there it is, that's going to be a huge amount of Yeller's health back, and thanks to Guardian, absolutely no cold is applied there. So that's back up to 42.7% on a plus two, plus two, plus one Yeller, and that is a lot to deal with from Wiki Colonel, and a lot of a, a lot of aggression for little reward. If the Schween got hit that turn instead, that would have been massive. If we'd seen like a Crystal Spikes and an Uppercut into the Schween, that could have been a KO'd Schween, and then the uh, Yowler would have actually had to like deal with the rest. But in the meantime, Wiki, uh, Wiki Colonel steals the Schween. Uh, could be a really useful pickup, actually. I don't honestly know what else Tsubaki is running on the Shween. We haven't seen it actually pull out a lot of attacks yet. The Oshidashi hits into the Yowler, which is still a pretty significant amount of damage, bringing it down to 27.1%. The Suplex comes back, though, with a mighty force as the Golzi is once again crushed into the ground, a single hit, knocking it out of the, knocking it out of the game. Tsubaki is showing that um, if you disrespect the Kinu Yaller opener, if you do not show it the appropriate uh, respect, then it will stomp all over you. Schween providing excellent support for the Hibernate. Kinu coming in there for the fantastic swaps, giving it plus three, plus three, keeping some excellent momentum on Tsubaki's side of the board. As Swappy bounces again, 
Gotta love that swappy. As instead we see the Calavis come in for all of those hits that are potentially intended for that uh, charming sprite. As the burn and the bite come down onto Yowler, but is it going to be nearly enough? No, it's not going to be enough. The Oshidashi comes in for the Mimit. The Mimit is only just going to survive this thanks to the burn. That's an impressive Mimit. A Shween is not a 10 that is known for its physical defense, and it tanked that. But before we go thinking, okay, ding dong, the beast is dead, remember that bear just took out two Thames and most of another one for the price of only itself and almost no aggression onto, Keen onto Tsubaki's other Thames. The only thing that's taken damage is the Kinu, which takes 10% on every swap. This is a fantastic board state for Tsubaki. So now we're just going to do the same thing for all the other stuff. So the Kinu comes in, uh, another bit of protection there for um, Calibus alongside everything else. Additionally, it's a bit more water aggression into that. We see the Generify come out from the hedge in. Always a nice thing to see because that at least means that the Hedgehog is protected for a couple turns. Valish is going to be taking some heat though, and uh, there's not really much you can do to avoid that. Uh, now, one upside here is that outside of, of course, uh, Tsubaki's Falish, which as we saw last game is a knife fight machine with sharpening and some other really valuable tools, we'll have to see whether that winds up turning the tides here as well, because while Flying Oct is a pretty powerful beast into things, um, it doesn't have the best aggression into this board. It will, however, just devour things. And yep, our champion Swappy here just... Uh, rock in the house definitely a powerful thing so as we continue to see this uh wiki kernel is kind of hanging on by a thread this game definitely a much worse position thanks to the kino yaller really popping off there um definitely just crushing into wiki kernel not being able to get the um not being able to get the KO on Yowler before it got the Hibernate off meant it was able to get so much collateral damage down before everything else happened. So definitely interesting to see. Uh, I don't know how else they're going to take this back. It's going to need to be a Madness buff. A Madness buff could take this back. Uh, madness buff and then a swap in on the other spot like you get the Mimit in there. That could be something. But there needs to be some kind of a massive turnabout on Wiki Kernel's side because otherwise you've got two Thames and none of them are looking particularly sturdy. The Fire Tornado comes down into the Schween. One could anticipate attempting to take advantage of its low HP, uh, well, low overall bulk despite its high HP. And the Crystal Spikes comes down as well and it's not enough to take it out. The Madness buff would have been really useful there. But instead, the Crystal Bite comes down alongside the H-Slap, which alongside the Poison Tick is actually enough to take down the Valish this turn, meaning it is not able to be the comeback engine for Wiki Kernel. We're down to literally a Mimit with 12.5% health and a Hedgen. So we're stuck with a Calibus. Now, last game, the stealing Calibus was fantastic. The problem is this time the Mimit had to eat a soup uh, had to eat an oshi earlier and that was a massive thing to try to take um with a full health valish in the back i think there's no way i could ever in good conscience say that tsubaki doesn't have this game um there, there's no way for wiki kernel to do enough to the present board and still have anything to deal with the valish afterwards all we need to see is one water jet here and the hedgen is down uh even if it gets the generify off this turn that's half of its health down then we still see aggression out of the shween there's a lot that we can see the hellfire does outspeed everything on this board obviously meaning the shween does go down but flying oct is more than capable of dealing with with this the overexertion has happened on the hedge and the toxic ink goes in onto the mimic meaning that it does not quite go down because this is a chonky mimic and it does overexert the calibus interesting thing to see so the doppel brooch comes down as well and now we have the valish on the field so fire tornado would be an option if the hedge wasn't already overexerted so the ox on the hedge is really bad here it means that swappy can get up to his old tricks again and there we go, our main man Swappy coming in and giving plus one, plus one to Valish inside this. So the base jump takes out the Mimit. 
and now it's hedging against the world, and one of the things it's against is a Calibus in the back. All Tsubaki needs to do at this point is grind enough out of this Hedgen, and then just win with Calibus. Like, Calibus still wins this 100%. But in the meantime, it's kind of like, you know, letting it overexert again, getting the easy turns onto it, making sure it can't get a Generify. And after that plus one, plus one, the Valish is still looking relatively healthy as the Sacrifice comes down as well, giving it even more HP and even more defense, getting the Sack buff on, and then there we go. We're off to the races. The sharpening comes down as well. Plus one attack and speed. Very intimidating to see. And now I'm pretty sure just Water Jet wins this. Like the Valish is cool, but I don't know what it's doing here against the Hedgen that this um, Water Jet isn't just tearing it to pieces with. And there we go with that KO. Wiki Colonel loses the second game as it is 1-1 for Tsubaki Chen and Wiki Colonel. Congratulations to Wiki Colonel on taking a game off in Tsubaki Chen. Not an easy feat, but obviously congratulations and well played to Tsubaki Chen for that second game. Uh, right, we do have some other games available, but unfortunately I will not be available to cast those. Uh, we do have some other fine vocal talent that will be hopping in at their best opportunities. So uh, do look forward to those as well. And thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, we do hope that you'll enjoy everything else that's happening here. I've been Quarter and have a lovely day.
Hello everybody and welcome over to the official Tem Team League. My name is Jan Tan. You can call, if you want, you can call me JT. As many people know me, I am the Swedish Viking for some reason. I don't know why, but apparently I am a Swedish Viking. Anyway, we are going to see a fantastic match between the LA and Cielo AOI. I even have to listen on Cielo's name because I will butcher a lot of names. And I'm pretty sure I have butchered this name already. And I, I have it, and it haven't even passed a whole minute. So we are having two very strong competitors from the Paradox engine. And we all know Ali. Ali just going fuel fury into her aggressive temps. If we're taking a quick look here on the standings here. We see that LA just having a very, very clean lead right now. Nothing has been touching her so far into this. While CL and Reese is having there with three points each and SMV down there with nothing so far. But don't you worry, I am pretty sure we will see some points coming in the of more of these players. As we are just waiting for the both competitors getting ready to um, deciding of who is going to be inviting who. We are still having uh, roughly two minutes left. And to be really honest, I haven't been able to watch any of their, their matches. So I'm going to walk in with no expectation at all. And apparently, um, according to here, it's in the title says Group B, and on the stream level it says Group A and Group D. Does that mean we are playing in Group C? But don't you worry, even the best guys can fail a little bit. I mean, you probably have won someone's heart, as in Davio, even if you're getting zero points. We see the, the correction here. Group B and Group B. Thank you so much. The guy who is dealing all of this in the back line. You will be remembered because you did an amazing job. Poggers. Do we have any poggers in the chat? Seems like uh, we are going into the match here. Okay, so we see some interesting temps here already that have caught my eyes, especially the classic, now I'm gonna say the classic Oshiara and Fire Coach combo here. Having as well the night guys on, on the back line with Scarabolt. So this is gonna be a as it seems like a pretty, pretty aggressive team here. Well if we look on the on Alice side, how many of these um, 2K do we see these days? And we see also another fire core ship. But we see that actually Ali decided to banning that Nagais. guys. I mean Nagais guys in general is really annoying Tem itself, like ma madness buff and just fury into the beyond and better burst until the destiny. Like, yeah, I, I don't think you want, want anything of that. And most of like Alice's strategy is like, just, just go forward. Like there's no going back, not like taking anything cool. Like just go full banana. That's, that's what Alice is all about. And we see the Oshara being the band for 
it's yellow. And I mean, yeah, that is, it's a reasonable ban. Definitely reasonable ban to see the OCR ban here. I mean, if we look at Fire Course, we're looking at Wolf, if we're looking at uh, Bullet Queen, if we're looking at uh, Mo Flank here, like they're big, big no. Like, I mean, they can still do fairly good damage onto OCR as well, but you don't. You all probably only want to see one of Shara on the field, if you even get lucky to see that. But as we see that, Ali decides to bring up the Wolf here. Good start. Good start so far here. Uh, Wolf can be really aggressive, plaguing beyond, and just being that general, really, really annoying little uh, Wolf. While Seal here has been wondering about, should I really pick this Mo flank? Um, Mothling it itself, it's a really a powerhouse train. Like, if, if it goes completely berserk already, getting a few speed buff, if it's possible, getting if it's someone's running a. Uh, so you're getting a plus attack, it can just completely start ramming people. Like, there, there's no stop. Once Mothling have started, you can't stop it. And as we can see, the Mothling have been picked up here. And we do know also that. Wolf is generally having a weak um, defense in generally, so Mothang is starting off and doing a lot of damage towards this little wolf field. Like it's gonna be really, really good. And we do actually see Volcrim being picked up here. Interesting start here with two very high damage physical attacker here. We're having some burn effects here. Probably we'll see some flamer metering. And stone range and so on, but we see the Mushok have been brought in here. Mushok is also is another like of these times that no, you don't want to run into this Mushok. Like it has such good coverage, especially if it's a parrier, it's even more annoying. And we have two physical on the board already, reducing it by 30%. If that runs double screen, there probably more defense on that. Like it's gonna do nothing, literally nothing. But as we can see on the second ban here, the 2k have been banned on the ally side, while on the sailor side, we see actually the Scarabolt being banned, while ally decided to pick up her own Mo flank. So we could have two power train Mo flanks on the board here. It's gonna be already a good start here. And we do see Wolfie and Oshiara on the other side. Wow, we are going really having some crazy, crazy rounds there. I can feel that the Fire Coach and the Valage there, the, Quet the Quetzal combo is ready here. Between the two neutral temps here, this coach is going to go nuts. Unless you can find a way to killing either of the neutrals or the coach itself. But el eliminating the coach would be the easiest target. But trying to kill the coach while the ally is... is um, Taking the lead over it, like, ah, controlling over it? No, it, there's no way. And we see the fire course on the other side being picked as well. And this is the game one between of two, between Ally and the other air. Let's get into this match here. And what can we see particularly from this match here, from turn one? So what, what we could particularly see here is, uh... Wolfie could potentially just try to deciding where does it need to play, or they could just do an early um, life will sap here, just to making sure that uh, it's, it's getting generations going on here, just don't losing too much HP if they decide to double up a Wolfie. Moshek is probably just going to uppercut the Volcan slots here. I mean, it could just try to do some P jabbing in case something else would come in. If now Alec could potentially see Oshara or Fire Course might. Getting in here, a waste water would be an optimal move here as well. As we see, yes, the wolf is leaving the field here. Making the entrance for Mole Flank. And it's an hurry ward Mole Flank here, which means that it can already get in goring the next turn, or it's getting closer as well to getting that execution. And we see actually. Um, so decided to like, you know what? I'm not gonna care about the Wolfie. I'm gonna try to do as much damage I can towards um, this Mushu. The, the more damage I can do to this, the better it is. So just trying to get rid of it, it's really good. So now, as in this turn two here, like I, 
but by how much damage they did actually on to Mushuk here, Mushuk can actually take in another double here. Without dying here. But the Moltlank here, having one minus defense is gonna cause a lot of momentum if it decides to keep it staying, but it, it stays there and it's going immediately with Goring here. And we see the Volcrane is doing the stone range here. And getting completely safe behind there. But is this base up is enough to killing it? No, and it is not enough to killing it. And it's staying at 6.9%. This is so close. By two minus defense, still surviving. A Mo flank, probably max attack with the resistance batch. And we all know that resistance batch on any neutral temps it's doing a lot of more damage especially with the stab we all know how much it can do so now still i have to be really careful here because if now say still say any more users of this moflank moflank needs to leave the building now or at least leave the field because we are outside of apparently here and Oh, we see the cage here! Oh no! Did we see this coming from? Yeah, I still saw this one coming, saw the, saw the cage coming, but we're not faster than the Goring, so the Goring is going to take it off. Volkring is just resting that turn, just making sure it's getting it back a little bit of the stamina here. But now, Mushuk is stuck. Both flank is stuck. Ziella have a free entrance of getting in any times they're on the board. And I think though, either having in Wolfie or having in uh, OJRS could be one of uh, one of the safer choices here, just to getting that early damage right in. And we see the OJRS coming in here, having the Qualic Whirlwind ready here, which means this mole flank can get eliminated this turn if it's really really unlucky however we might expecting this motion dying this turn as well as we see as the aquatic landing directly on the motion and we see both actually getting a double kill here that is so huge for Celio here oh god this this is really really big even though the allies are right now behind but losing two times here, I don't think it is really. I, I've somehow I I can still see Ali be able to come back into this match because I still already have lost Moflank earlier, but losing Mushok and losing Moflank is kind of pain. Definitely feels it, it feels really in your wallet if you talk about those those turns here. But as it is here right now, that fire, fire cores can't really walk in here. Like there's, there's no like a free entrance here. Like sure, you you can do some early damage towards uh, Oshiara, but Oshiara is just going to slap with some water right in the koi's face, and the koi will not appreciate it. However, the Volcarin is really low on stamina here. Even though it has one evasion, it can stay there for a turn without feeling any threat. But it decided to leave the board here. And we see actually the wolf is being brought out here on the battlefield here. As we can see, the plague actually landing directly on the Oshiara, putting it down to 27% HP. Who was faster, the Oshiara or the Vlash here? And the Oshiara is actually faster. The, the, the Vlash will taking definitely damage here, but how much overexertion will it be on the Oshiara? Always put it down to 3% HP, and this is actually a Physical Valash. We haven't seen a, a couple of physical Valash a little bit back in here, but the, most of the time, like you normally see a, a special attacker Valash here. We all know how good actually a special attack Valash is, but getting to see a, as well a physical Valash is also quite inter interesting here. But now. The Lash doesn't like this board at all. This is this is a board that the Lash doesn't want to face against. So now is the question here: If Ally wanna really win 
or getting a a little bit of overcome here she need to find a tam that is really weak and facing towards that bullet crane that bullet crane doesn't like and it does more takes and doing as well the base jumps just to finish off the work here can def definitely be enough but we have to be aware of because of the gen jutsu could be on bullet crane right now and, and if it's ready it should be ready and if we see a plague gen jutsu combo here this valash won't stand but the bullet crane will go over exertion if it decides to actually do the jutsu here But both Celio and Alec both have their fire coach in the back line. As Celio can't use the Quetzal combo here because the both like is already dead. While Alec can still use the fire Quetzal if it's really needed. But Alec needs to really find a good swap in so it feels safely for the fire coins. And the Vialash doesn't take too much damage to making a good play to making sure that a Quetzal could come out here. Or. You, you, he, Alec could be really unlucky that it, it, this Quetzal probably won't come. Alec decided to swapping out the, the Valash here to bring in the Fire Course, try to make it the safest place as possible. And we see the Vicar Rose doing over 60% here with, with that trait of the Jinjutsu. Going before Wolf. If that Plague were actually landing before the Wolf can have gone, that would have taken much more and the wolf is surviving with 1.9% this wolfie is just hanging there hanging there with the smallest percent it can even have however this is a free vulcrane kill for uh, this fight boy share one water cannon and that is completely gone it completely gone. Like there's there's no way you can see this Volcan surviving that. If Ally really wanna deciding to to save the Wolfie, which actually Ally is doing to just bring in um uh, the uh where's the uh, Valash here and we do see that Quetzal's landing directly on this Wolfie doing Almost 40% as well. And we see the plague landing directly on the Valash here, get, getting down to 38.3%. Knowing as well that um, Bullcrane did actually overextend the previous turn, which make it very safe for Valash to come in here, making sure that uh, I, I can do one Quetzal here without taking too much damage on the Fire Coils. The Valash probably gonna take in a little bit more. But it should be fine. Now is the question here. If not does Vortex come up here. And landing it on the Valash slot here. No matter who Alice swaps in here. Will take that damage. But still decided not to play with the, with the Wolfie here. And actually taking in the Koi share. As we see the Jinjutsu. Hitting on that Volcrane. Taking it out here. Getting that lovely lovely scavenger proc here but we do see the quests getting thrown in there doing barely nothing it did roughly 15 percent i mean it was just basically you were scratching on it like it's just a scratch wound like what are you supposed to do with that but i don't see how uh, um so you know, can get out of this match we're still having the wolf in the back line for ally and all ally had to do just around is just go full aggressive here wolf is falling down here what is the coach is going to do here? we will probably see a quetzal here landing on the village and take off what is left of the village here but it doesn't matter what wolf is comes in here doing the damage probably killing as well the coach this particular turn that's coming up here and we have gg for ally here even losing the double, uh, the double tem of both, um, both flank and 
Mosha to still find a way to came back into this fight. And the Dust 4 takes finish of this match. And we have Ali in the lead here with 1-0 in matches. But don't you worry, folks. We still have another another matches coming up right after this one. We see who can take game two. If Nasilk is having a way to get into this match, getting that point that is necessary to having some kind of a a save, like, making sure they can stay in the top two above Rishi. And they are both having the same point. Just getting that one point. It's going to be probably huge in the end. As we're waiting right now for the both competitors, getting ready to sign... Deciding for who is going to be inviting who, we will get back into that action. And will we see any changes happening into this? Yes, we will see. Definitely, definitely. And they are already back in. There's no hesitation. So what can we potentially see here? Well, well maybe a, a Valash ban from Zero? Or maybe try to keep with the same strategy? Rosalio here. Just still decided to bet in the Oshiara here. I mean, the Oshiara is still, like I said in the previous match, it's still a good ban. Really, nothing bad about it at all. Like, Scarabolt doesn't like it, even though the Oshiara doesn't, doesn't like any lightning strikes, but it still do, can do fairly good damage onto Scarabolt. The Volcrane is a one shot. Like, we saw how much damage it did to. Mo flank like Wolfie would get a lot of damage as well. The fire coach is more or less dead. I mean, the only two te three times that can resist this is one that have been banned already, which is in that guys, and we having as well Kino and OGR that can resist fairly well, but they're still gonna be taking so much damage that you don't really feel comfortable having those out there on the field, especially what whatever the opponent can do in the next turn here. Ally still deciding to ban this now, guys. Here, of course. Like in the first game, we don't want to see the DA from the ally side. Ally doesn't want to get any, don't want to get the, still having any momentum with the DA, getting some early advantage. If we see on the ally side here, doesn't really have anything that can really be used under the DA, since like Moflank is probably the slowest, if not the two cap being the, uh, the one of the two slowest temps. But even if those are the slowest in her team, it doesn't help under the DA. Because the guys will always go before. But we'll like see Ally decided to still to taking up the Mushok and the Wolf. Like the previous start here. Both is a really good start here. With a plague poke here and P jabbing left and right. But now we're having an OCR here on the field. Maybe we will see a waste water on any of the slots now. As CEO here deciding what's gonna be the second time is gonna be standing next to Oshiara here. I mean, having the having the fire coach there just giving the lava waves energy. I mean, that's that's really cool. That's that could be really useful. But do you really want to take the early damage from Wolf? If that Wolf is faster than the fire coach, we do not really know that. But however, the Wolf can be decided to pick him here instead. Just decided to try to poke. Probably on the wolf or just be annoying to um, to uh, mature care. We do we we will see about that. But we see double mole flank and the fire coach. We see the Kino and another fire coach. We get a fire coach for days. I hope you guys loving seeing the fire coach because fire coach is apparently lit today. It's burning today. And we see the Blash here ending up here on the ally side here. And for those that just come in here, welcome to the official temp team here. We are in the match two between Ali and Celio AY. And Ali is already in that 1-0 lead here. Will Celio here take the second game and tie up this match series? There's only one way to find it out that we're gonna dive into this match and let's take it a deep look into turn one here. What could we potentially see from here? Okay, so we could potentially see Wolfie still decide to stay here doing Plague and also that Mushok deciding to do a wastewater directly just to try to do a maximum damage on the Oshiara. We saw how much damage it did on Oshiara last time, but the Oshiara decides to leaving 
Letting Keen coming in here, taking probably a hit or two, just to make sure that buffing up the bolt frame, getting a little bit more tanky. And we do see the hook landing directly on the Wolfie here. Now, Wolfie decides to plaguing. Plaguing this Volcrane, making sure it's trapped in here. Wasteboarded landing directly on the Kino here. From 32% down to 20%. That Kino can't stay there anymore. I mean, sure, Kino can still do probably one more move before either A, leaving, or B, just do a sacrifice and ho just hoping that this Volcrane will do enough. However, now is the question here, is this Volcrane faster than the Akino? We saw though that the Hook were faster than Wolfie, but will the Stone Trench be faster than a Plague or a, a DB? If that's the case, Volcrane will for sure survive the DB, but probably getting an uppercut or potentially just a regular PJB, it won't kill Volcrane out of that, but it will definitely depend putting Volcrane into a really rough position and it really needs to believe that I have to do some quick damage here before the Volcrane is dying here. That Wolfie is definitely in a threat here for Volcrane and that Wolfie needs to die as soon as possible. As soon as that one is dead, you, you can fairly deal pretty well against the Mushroom, but then, but then of course you have the fire course in the back line as well, getting one water cannon, that is not a good idea. And we see the plague going before the wall crane here. Do we see the stone trench coming out here? We do see the sacrifice here, removing all of the status effects here, getting it another defense and special defense. Now it's up to three plus three. And we see the stone wrench landing directly only on the mushroom because of the team elusive, it won't hit it. And the waste water. We're supposed to land on Kino, but it redirected to Volcrane, and Volcrane survived that turn. Now is a another question would be: Can you know, finding a way back into this match? Now we see actual Oshars coming up in here on the field. So now it could be I could see two different scenarios here that. So you have to go full aggressive mode here. There's like, there's no holding back here. You try to kill Wolfie as quick as possible. Or you try to do damage to get rid of the Mushok here. But there's no reason to go full aggressive on the Mushok because the OCR is just going to do half resistance. And Vol even though Volcrane having plus one attack, it still is going to be reducing the damage by 30% due to this parrier trade. So at, in this in this position, if you want to go full aggressive mode, you have to get rid of that wolf. That wolf can't be on the board anymore. Ally decided to actually taking wolf out of there and making sure so, uh, another attempt taking the hit that this could potentially be what it is. And Zealot really went for it, trying to get rid of the the wolf. They were standing there, but. This mole flank is taking the hits from it and it's will fall down due to the double up. But the vol the Volcrane actually getting overexcited is pretty painful. And we see how much Wastewater did on that Oshiara. Still standing 12%. 12%! And the Volcrane can't do anything this turn. Ally have a free and just getting back Wolf in here again. The only thing Sailor can do here is either, like, Sailor had to do a double swap here to if now want to have any, like, aggressive temp still standing on the board. But I think Sailor can't lose too much tempo either. So I'm assuming that probably that Sailor might want to lose just one temp, but I don't think you want to lose Volcrane this early. However, it it, it is already a rough position. Like, Wolfie is, is going to make sure that a DV is still enough to taking out that Volcrane. A Water Cannon is still enough, even though with plus, plus 3 special defense. I am sure about it because of the 4 times. Okay. Mushuk is overexerted here. 
Valash won't do much to um, to the Volt Train here because it is uh, a physical town. However, it still can chip a little bit and putting the Volt Train more into that um, uh, danger spot there. But as it is right now, Oshiara doesn't have the Aqualic Whirlwind ready, which means Wolfie can just do one plague and it will be enough to take out it. Here's the read now. Will actually Alec go directly on Oshiara or will it go directly to Volcrane and believing it, it, a swap will happen? We see now the Volcrane is being switched out here and letting the fire coins come in here. And we do see actually a double swap here that I was saying earlier that if, for me it has felt necessary to do just trying to have some uh, HP advantage for a short amount of And the plague is landing directly on the fire coach, losing about 41.5%, trapping the fire coach. But we saw how much actually the fire coach can do. And I do not believe in this is a bulky wolf. This is just a pure, pure speedy, hard hitting wolf that's supposed to just do its job. And we see actually an unnoticed mole flank here. This is gonna be really, really huge for Zero. If now Ellie deciding to stay with actually both of her, like the only thing that can take actually a double Quetzal and Goring is Mushuk, but Mushuk will fall due to how much damage it will, how much damage it will directly to it. The last doesn't want to come in there. Koish can take the Quetzal, but can't take a Gory. It probably won't fall, but it, it is not it is not a, a good option to do that. We do see actually that the wolf is getting out of there, trying to save in the Kino, getting Mushok in there. Will we see a sacrifice there? As we see the Quetzal's getting out there and Putting it down to below 22%, the Ice Cube landing on the Fire Coins, just making sure it is definitely in range to kill. And actually, this is not a bad idea out of Celio. Deciding to do split damage here. Now, and also not using the Goring is also very good at this position. Because the, I believe in the Goring will actually taking out this position. And now is the question as well, like this is the bigger question, if now we see a um, water cannon move here, water cannon move, wow I'm so good uh, describing words here, if water cannons coming out here, would it be faster than Alice? But we do see the Valash comes in here, and we do see the Goring landing directly on this Valash, will we see a Quetzal landing on the other temp? On this Mashoker, will it take it out? And it does, and it it is a free swap in for Ally to take in either either uh, Wolfie or ah, uh, I'm I'm losing words here. I'm, I'm supposed not to lose words here directly live on TV. <laughs> but we see that Wolfie is coming back in here. The fire charge is probably just gonna stay in behind there. Don't do anything because. You can't outspeed a plus three mouth like it's already out of control. But we do know already that this mouth uh, have already used the Goring, so the Goring is not available. But this plague were so important for for um, uh, Wolfir to taking out of that uh, uh, that fire coin. Is Alice going to finding back the momentum here? This is this is so so intense. Like it feels like every turn is so close to killing a single tam. And we do see Volcranes coming back here in the field. However, it doesn't have Jinjutsu ready this turn. It do have flame emitting ready if now it runs it. We do know already Stone Ball and we do know Stone Trench and uh, of course the Ninja Jutsu here. 
but that fire coin that Celia lost is worth so needed to taking out this Valash, but Valash is pretty frightened when it comes to defense itself. And we do see that the fire coin is coming in here for the ally side, and Celia decides to swap out the Bolt Crane and letting Oceanus coming in here, sacrificing here. The fire coach is falling down due to due to the goring, and we see allies using the jinjutsu here, losing the jinjutsu here. But I think it doesn't matter for ally. Ally still feel pretty confident here. And when we are walking in now to the the last couple of times here, this mo flank have plus four speed, but it doesn't have a lot of stamina. It can't even do a single base jump. We have to rest one particular turn here. And the Bolt Crane surviving barely out of that. The question is, do you have enough to take out the Valash? And the Bolt Crane just goes straight in. Just going bananas. Taking out the Wolf immediately. Not giving Ally any momentum going on here. And the Stone Trash doing... Take it down to 20%. The base jump landing on the Bolt Crane doesn't do anything. The bull crane having the entrance to taking on this Valash. This Valash can't do nothing. Jack shit! This is where it's taking place. And still is gonna take the second match using the hook. That felt a little bit. Was this really necessary? <laughs> and it's surviving sharp stab! Even though it's overexerted, uh, it doesn't matter. Celio taking it. Well, that's the full crate where huge having that plus three plus three defense with one plus attack did so much damage. As we said earlier, that ally and sailor taking one point each here, making so that they're still comfortable at in first and second place here. I do not believe there's any more matches right now, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was the last match of the today. Okay, I'm get, I'm getting the correct information here that there is there is no more matches after this one. So I appreciate every single one of you been staying around here, watching some fantastic matches today. As we are going to send everything over to another tournament. It is the AAL tournament over at Plus Channel. So please, if you want to watch more competitive, we're going straight over there. We go over there, we're going to watch more competitive stuff there. But I'm Jan and I'm glad to have you here, and I'll see you guys next time.